Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's medical podcast. I am your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the crowd's still the crowd's still here. They're still here. I decided. Well, look, I paid Big to bucks. have them for half a day. So, uh, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Matthew Barton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd laugh at him too. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, which you can, uh, you can look and laugh at Matt as well. <laughs> Otherwise, you just have to laugh at his horrible, horrible voice. I uh, and Matt together are senior lecturers of biosciences, which is anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, and pharmacology to health science students. We help them understand how the human body works by going through various the human structures. body. Oh, sorry. Well, that's true, but systems and structures. And things like that. And some of our best or most, well, best received episodes are those that cover the entire human System. body. Um, but before we begin, I just want to ask, how are you? <laughs> you good? Yes, I'm well, thank you. What's new? Um, well, you know that I had a daughter. Yep. She's That's seven, old news, man. She's seven weeks. No now. one cares anymore. Okay, yeah. damn it. Okay, sorry. That's it then. Wow. That's really all. Boring. Is she well? Is she good? Happy? She's well. Healthy? Yep. Plump? Plump. Good. They want to be plump. Yep. So she's gone through a couple of sizes already wow. of clothing and nappies. <laughs> good on her. Good on her. No, it's good. It's all good. Wonderful. More busy. I'm more, definitely more busy. It, it eats your time up. Yeah, that's it for does. sure. It does. Yeah. So, well. But like no complaints. Good. Good. And no uh, one would care. Yeah. Well. Um, what about you? Yeah, okay, thanks for asking. Yeah, I was just... Um, Were you really fishing? Guys, stop it. Get out of here. My God. Um, you were really fishing for that, weren't you? I'd look, I sometimes I just need to be um, asked how I am. Mm. I'm well. Well, I, I generally do that, but, you know, <coughs> hour and a half later, still going. Yeah, I do talk a lot. Uh, and I do talk a lot about me and, you know, just how good and amazing and... Anyway... Uh, I'm fine. Nothing new. But I'll tell you what I was doing. I was thinking about... I was playing a video game the other day. I was showing my daughter one of the old video games that I used to play. And I was... Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, no. Uh, Monkey Island. Did you ever play Monkey no, Island? I don't know anyway, what it is. LucasArts game. They made a number of them. They're brilliant. But I was talking to her about SimCity. Did you ever play SimCity? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I was thinking about SimCity. And... I loved, you know, you basically, you've got the mayor, which is like this deity figure. It's the overarching figure that controls the whole thing. And underneath the mayor, you've got the governments that can be controlled. You, you know, so you've got things like um, these various organisations like town planning that can help produce more and bigger cities. You've got the developers that can help grow the city, you know, make buildings and various constructions. You've got the energy power plant that delivers the energy to the various houses and buildings. You've got the, the individuals and the companies that deliver the resources to the power plants and things like that. Uh, and you've got like the emergency services, police department, fire brigade, um, uh, ambulance service, right. right? And I was talking about how I used to play this game and my aim was to just build it bigger and bigger. Metropolis. Yeah, make it as large as possible. So I would basically put everything on steroids, right? So I would make the town planners create more cities. I would make the developers create bigger buildings. And I how, did, make, how did you like prevent natural disasters? Because well, that was my problem. There you go. So this is the problem. I invested so much in just building and amping everything up that it just failed because I, I couldn't make it sustainable. Ultimately, the mayor became corrupted with power. That's you. And decided to, I am the mayor, <laughs> to continually ch just amp everything up. And it right. failed. It failed. Okay. And um, my daughter said, well, that's unsurprising because in my eyes, you're also a failure. And I said, wow. that's she's not appropriate. Only, you're five. She's only five. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, so did you? You played SimCity, you said. Yeah, I played it. I wouldn't say it to the frequency that it sounds like you had. Well, it was but just twelve I, hours a day for seven <laughs> years. I just um, used to get attacked by the uh, what was it? Not the, not a Godzilla. The other thing, like the it was like a, a big reptile that used to come and oh yeah, flatten yeah. my city. Yeah. Well, that's that only happened to you. It didn't happen to any oh, other player. Really? Yeah. yeah. It was okay. That's what the game developers did, <laughs> just for you specifically. So, yeah. But I didn't do all those uh, 
uh, I didn't go to the degree that you sounds like you went to. I just built and didn't do it very successfully. Mm. But neither did I. But yeah, I'm thinking that right. you're using this game as an analogy for today's would I topic? Would I? Would I be that smart? <laughs> would I be that wily to be able to do that? So, am I correct by assuming that you are correct? So what today's is the analogy I'm using. Well, you got a city. I do. Um, which I guess is the body, the human body. Okay. And a whole lot of things have to be well regulated for the, the body, in this yep. case the city, to function effectively. Okay. And if you don't have all these things in balance, quite deleterious outcomes occur, like buildings falling apart, floods. Um, what else could happen? Not Godzilla. But well, what would that be? <laughs> uh, it could be an infection. <laughs> it could be a fungal or bacterial or viral infection coming in rampaging the city. But yes, I was using this as an analogy or euphemism uh, for, for the endocrine system. The endocrine system. I and I even intentionally said putting things on steroids, Matthew. Yes, I got that. Because I didn't think I should bring hormones. it in because then it might it lose its. You know, what if, whatever, yes. Yeah. So, yes, the point was that the endocrine system, just like SimCity, has to be this nice harmonious balance. If you want to build something up, it's going to cost something and there's going to be repercussions of that. And so you don't want to continuously build a building as high as physically possible because it's not going to hold. Yeah, that's There's right. going to be problems. And the same happens if you want to start to just reproduce as many city di- cities as possible or if you want to start pumping out as much electricity as you possibly can, there's going to be downstream and upstream effects. Yeah. And that is just like the endocrine system. There are upstream, downstream effects for everything that happens. And it has to be this dynamic homeostatic balance that occurs. And today we're going to talk about the endocrine system and highlight the various structures and functions, and hopefully be able to demonstrate to everybody the major hormones, major glands, and how they maintain balance yes. and health. You good. good with that? Yeah, so we'll start with some fundamentals and basics first, and then we'll go into the specifics of the glands. Do you know what the etymology of endocrine is? To cry. Sorry? To cry. Crying. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought it was cell crying. Cell crying. Doesn't endo mean within? Uh, possibly. Within crying. I think what it's referring to is structures that can release chemicals for itself. Okay. So hormo- uh, hormones, which are the major chemicals released by endocrine tissue, uh, are released into the local environment, but also the systemic environment. Yeah. Uh, and so it's basically like these glands are crying. They're releasing these chemicals because they don't release them into ducts. And I'm not talking about quack, quack, which I wish I had a drop <laughs> right now to be able to press, but I'm referring to D-U-C-T-S. Yep. So if uh, a structure releases a chemical into a duct, that's like exocrine. A, like a, a salivary duct or a sweat gland or the pancreas. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that is exocrine, not endocrine. Yep. But in this case, endocrine is releasing it out into the open. Yep. So it can jump into various, let's just say the bloodstream or the lymphatic system and carry it to either local or distant areas of the body to have its effect. Yep. All right, let's jump back to the beginning. What do you want to start with? Well, I think firstly, we'll just say that it's a communication system in the body yeah, because great. the body is made up of trillions of cells and they are distant away from each other. So to communicate and tell something a long way away to do something... Uh, requires some degree of communication. Isn't the nervous system... Yeah, we so we did nervous system last week or fortnight. Yeah. That was a form of communication, but that's a very fast form of communication and a very localised form of communication using and electricity. Direct. And direct. Yeah. So, so I think that's the major... Di- they're the major differences, right? Is that the nervous system and the endocrine system, yes, they're both communication networks. They're both there to tell structures to do things. Uh, but the nervous system is a lot faster, mm-hmm. it's direct, and it's short-acting. Yeah, on and off. Yeah. yeah and very localised. Did you say that? Uh, I didn't. I just said okay. direct. So then if we focus now on the endocrine system, which is a system of crying yeah. to somewhat, there are a couple of fundamentals to, to bear in mind for all this system 
regardless of how we break it down. So the first fundamental is the it's made up of glands or tissues that will do the excretion. The crying, mate. The, the crying, yep. Now the tears <laughs> is hormones. Okay. Which are just basically chemical messages. Yeah, so students will ask me things like, what's the difference between a hormone and a neurotransmitter? And the th- answer is, well, nothing. Nothing really. They're yeah. basically the same. It's just about the tissue that releases it yeah. and where it's released. Onto. Or, yeah, or yep. into. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. So that then goes to the fundamental three, which is just uh, it needs a target organ or a, a target tissue. Right. And so I guess with those three fundamentals in mind. What are the three again? Gland or tissue that will do the excreting. Yeah. The hormone itself. What's the second one? The hormone itself. You got three <laughs> fingers already up. So first like, one. The first one I gave, I gave gland and tissues. Okay. But that's let's, one, is That's it? one. All right. Hormone, it releases which is hormone. the messenger. Yeah. And then the target tissue. So it needs a target. Okay. So they're the three things it needs. That's a right. gland, f- a hormone, and a target tissue. Yep. Right. Now, with that said, um, I guess, mm, I won't say, well, I guess you could say somewhat historically but I think the endocrine system, as in the systems of the body, was a fairly recent system to be discovered. So, so you mean like out of the cardiovascular yeah. system, respiratory system, it was more recent? Yeah, I think pretty much the turn of the 20th century was where significant advancements in the endocrine system was discovered. Well, I think one of the reasons why is because if it's very easy to have a look at the cardiovascular system. It's all connected. Got a digestive system, it's all connected. Respiratory, all connected. The endocrine system isn't connected, yeah, right? Yeah. Like the only connection between them is probably the, the um, cardiovascular system, a, a blood supply, but that is not in itself part of the yeah. endocrine system. So that's probably one of the reasons why. And I probably get our understanding of chemistry yeah. wasn't fully um, accomplished at that point and possibly micro, microbiology. Well, yeah, I guess microbiology in terms of seeing well into small cells and knowing what the cells are doing. Yeah. But, you know, an example, and this was a debate recently on Twitter, um, what should should be the name of the pituitary gland, right? Right. And now my understanding of the etymology of the pituitary gland means uh, to produce mucus or something like that, right? Yeah. Now, that would have been assumed probably centuries ago Mm. that when it was looked at, it did secrete a fluid that was probably mucusly like, yeah. but they wouldn't have known it wasn't snot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They d- wouldn't have known chemically what was coming out of it, right? So it's kind of right, but they just didn't know what that mucus was. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. So they probably had an, an idea that there were these things like, you know, the pancreas, the adrenal glands. I'm sure they definitely were discovered, yeah. but what they truly did was a bit unknown. A bit unknown. Yeah. And it wasn't until they started to experiment with these glands, like chop them up and Isolate. swallow them or something or, yeah. or inject them into animals to see what they actually did. And, you know, that's where you'd get to discover insulin or adrenaline is, or yeah. thyroid hormones just by going, here's something weird we don't know. Let's just crush it and, and inject it. it into a dog <laughs> or a rat and see what happens to it. And you go, oh. Or pull it out, like, you know, let's pull out the the parathyroid gland. And see what happens. And see what happens to the, the dog. Oh, it can't regulate its calcium well and it gets weird bones. They used to do a lot in dogs and cats, didn't they? Yeah. Pretty horrendous. Uh, but not anymore. Uh, which is probably a good thing, I think. Uh, so, but, but following that, yeah. so with the endocrine system, because I guess at least when I studied it, it was these discrete you know, organs, right? So mm. hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal glands, thyroid, um, pancreas even. But more and more now we're discovering that it's beyond just glands. Tissues can do it that aren't necessarily considered an endocrine gland. Yeah. So, you know, like the pancreas, which is a bit debatable, but that's probably more exocrine than endocrine. Mm-hmm. Um, the gonads, you know, that's probably more for producing sperm or eggs then producing hormones, but they or can at least do it. known for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you have um, smaller amounts of tissue that does completely opposite functions like kidney, mm. right? So the kidney, as we know, its function is more 
to uh, filter blood, but it can also produce chemicals that yeah. can be pushed out into the body yeah. or it, or maybe just local to the kidney that will have endocrine-like effects. Yeah, I think we could, we're pretty safe in saying that probably most tissues of the body would, by definition, secrete a hormone or a number of hormones and it would secrete it potentially just very locally to act upon itself or to act upon something within its close vicinity or even release something to jump into the bloodstream and act quite distally or far away. And in actual fact, they're the, they're the three yes. major ways that... Well, it's actually four, but you get, we'll oh, go with go, those okay. three. Okay, so if a, a, a tissue releases a hormone that allows for it to act upon itself, we call that autocrine, yeah. right? Uh, if it releases a hormone to act upon its local environment, it's called paracrine. And then if it releases it into the bloodstream to act distantly... Because blood goes everywhere. What do we call that? Uh, endocrine. Endocrine. Mm. But what's this fourth one? I think it's intracrine. Which it is, doesn't even release it. It's just within its own cell. So it's not even released. It's just made and then it acts upon an yeah. internal receptor. Yeah. And I guess a lot of... Do you have an example of that? Uh, I, I was meant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's just... <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That one. That's fair. That's fair. Um, but that's more of a modern addition. All right. All right. But that could be just all the internal signaling, which is interesting because once we talk about, but uh, how can it be termed a hormone if, by definition, a hormone must is a chemical that must be released into the environment? Otherwise, it's just a chemical, a chemical. An, in, yeah. an intracellular chemical messenger. So I say to those people... Okay, uh, I could have, you know, potentially not explained it well, but intracrine intercr uh, is the term. <laughs> All right, so we've got autocrine at least, paracrine and endocrine. So some examples, Yep. Uh, let's say an example of paracrine would be, let's say during inflammation, you have cell injury and you would have a certain... Not, well, not, you'd have certain cells that are located in tissue that is likely to be injured with um, anything from the outside world. You know, this could be a, a microorganism. Yep. It could be from mechanical trauma. It could be temperature changes. It could be pH changes. And they, you could have some cells that are within your outer tissue, like your skin or maybe mucous membrane, that when they pick up this stimulus they release chemicals which then act on the local environment and that's yeah. why you have local inflammation. And so an example here could be histamine. right? And so histamine being released by basophils or mast cells have a quite profound impact on blood vessels in that local region. So is histamine termed a hormone? Well, it's a chemical messenger. So this is again where we start to get... The, the boundaries, the definition boundaries are a little bit blurred. Because yeah. an example of autocrime is interleukin-2 being released by the T-cells. T-cells. Right? And so it can be released and act upon itself. Whilst it's signalling to another immune cell to activate it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, hey, B-cell, I found something dodgy. I want to communicate with you to tell you that there's something here that I want you to... Um, make antibodies for yeah while i'm also going to act upon myself, myself to just make more of me that's right so, so i can release more of yeah. me so i'll start cloning myself yeah. because it's important that i'm as a t helper cell are going to regulate this immune response that's right and i mean it's all in the name interleukin between white cells mm. so the interleukins are the chemical mediators between the t and b cells and also between t and t cells and b and b cells all right an endocrine could be a whole oh, range of stuff right that we're going to insulin talk about. Insulin. So insulin gets released, and that's a good one because insulin gets put into the blood and in theory should go everywhere because it's important to allow glucose to enter certain tissue yeah. to bring the blood sugar levels down. The question we need to ask ourselves now is what can trigger or stimulate an endocrine tissue to release uh, this hormone right, or a hormone? And so there's, we spoke about three major ways that the hormones can work, auto, para, and endocrine. 
but there's also three different types of stimulus or stimuli that can trigger an endocrine tissue or gland to release a hormone. So the first one it, uh, could be neural. So a neural stimulation. So you could have a uh, nervous innovation, a neuron that basically speaks to a endocrine tissue and says, hey, release the hormone. Right. Got an example of this? Yep, the um, innermost part of the adrenal gland called the medulla. Yeah. So this has a cluster of cells that will release catecholamines, so adrenaline, I guess adrenaline. Is it yeah. noradrenaline as well? Yep. Okay. So this nerve will go there from the sympathetic nervous system and it will speak to this cluster of cells when you are having a profound sympathetic fight and flight response and that tells those cluster of cells in the deep part of your adrenal gland to pump out adrenaline into your blood. So you've got a neuron coming from the spinal cord speaking directly to your adrenal gland and it says, hey, adrenal gland, release adrenaline. Yep. Release into the bloodstream and let's have this whole body Huge. fight or flight response. Which is interesting because typically when we, uh, and we did this last podcast, but when we do the sympathetic nervous system, well, actually both parasympathetic and sympathetic, they're usually... Um, broken into two neurons, right? Yeah. yeah. And so sometimes when you study the sympathetic, this is always the outlier, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the only one. So when you say two neurons, just for the listener, if they haven't listened to that episode, the let's just say the fight or flight system, going from the spinal cord to whatever organ it wants to affect to have a fight or flight response, let's say the heart, it's only two neurons. So it goes from the spinal cord to the sympathetic a, to chain. A, to a, the sympathetic chain, which then speaks to the second neuron. Which is usually a long one. And that long second neuron goes to the organ to have its such effect. As the, such as the heart. And that's, that seems to be, you know, this global dogma, universal dogma for sympathetic and parasympathetic. They're both two neuron chains. Yep. But not in this case with the adrenal gland. So this one was always considered the outlier. Mm-hmm. So when I used, well, when I was in my undergrad and I s- was studying the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, you'll be told, here's the anatomy, here's the two neuron pathway that you need to, to learn. And But there's always an, there's one exception, and that's the adrenal gland. It only has one neuron going to it. So it's a pre-ganglionic neuron, just right. that first one. That's right. But then when you learn a bit of embryology, you realise that the medulla is just the post-ganglionic neuron. So right. that whole cluster of... Adrenal medulla cells are just neurons. Really? Yeah. And well, so there you go. they're just releasing again. Yeah. The neurotransmitter, which normally would just go onto the organ. Of course. But in this case, it goes into the blood. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Love it. Love so, it. It, so it goes back to what you're saying about the neurotransmitter now becoming a hormone. Exactly. Mm. All right. So that's the neural stimulation. You've also got hormonal stimulation where a gland can release a hormone that travels to another gland to tell it to release a hormone. And there's a lot of examples of this, but the first thing I want to say is that the first gland that releases the hormone, usually the name of that hormone ends in the suffix tropic. Okay. And that term tropic really refers to the fact that this is a hormone that's going to travel to another gland to tell it to release another hormone. Yeah. So... As a listener or a student or a learner, when you see or hear that word tropic on the end of any hormone word, go, oh, that means this hormone is going to go to another tissue to tell it to release another hormone. Okay. And so examples of this can include the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. It releases a bunch of hormones to talk to the anterior lobe of the pituitary Pituitary. gland, Um, like uh, like gonadotropin. Right, so gonadotropin yep, yep. Uh, that travels from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary to release the gonadotropins. Which is so you got gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, and it goes to the anterior pituitary to release the gonadotropins, which are more hormones that go to more glands to release more hormones. Yeah, right. Yep. So anyway, that's the hormonal. Now the last one, uh, it depends it's a, it's on the textbook fu- you it's read. It's a funny one. Yeah, it's called humoral. But you didn't get that? Oh, I get it. Funny one. Sorry. That was... Yeah. Wait a second. There we go. Yeah. But it deserves both. No, they're not laughing because it was funny. Okay. So <laughs> the humoral, uh, like you said, it's an odd one because 
many current textbooks don't really refer to it as humoral uh, because it's referring back to the old term, the humours of the body, which is based in pseudoscience and not in science. The humours are based... To, to the Greeks. Tell that to the ancient Greeks. I would. I'll t- I don't know how, but I'll, I'll say it to them. Uh, it's about having nutrients, pretty much it's nutrients, inside the bloodstream. And these nutrients are the stimulatory signals to tell a gland to release a hormone. So a great example of this is glucose. Yep. Glucose in the bloodstream goes to the pancreas, triggers the beta cells to release insulin. And now that insulin can go to the various tissues and have its effect mm. to help bring that glucose into certain cells of the body. And that is the humoral response. So there's yep. three, neural, hormonal, and humoral. Three different stimuli. And so the humoral is basically just the concentration of a molecule, really, right? Yeah, yeah. I so think. that will impact. And so if you're... Well, I think mostly, most of the time, it's a nutrient. And then it's feeding back on its own self. So if that goes in the opposite direction, then it will then usually shut off. And th- this kind of goes to the regulation of these. So you said how they're secreted. Yeah. But also we need to regulate them um, to, to don't... to uh, Not over-release. Yeah. And so the u- usually the two st- ways that we do this would be a, a negative feedback loop or a positive feedback loop. That's important. That's how we maintain that balance. And so most of the hormones that we're going to be speaking about today is in negative feedback. So that means, again, we'll use um, insulin as an example. Uh, no, is that the best example? Well, it is kind of humorally. Yeah. How about the example I like to use because it makes sense to people is when people take um, anabolic steroids and let's just say people are taking testosterone, right? And so if they take exogenous testosterone from a needle and inject it into them, if they're taking so much testosterone that it goes super super physiological level, Mm. so above normal levels, because of the negative feedback, if your testosterone levels in the body go up, that's going to negative feedback negatively feed back on the tissues that make your endogenous testosterone and like your gonads for example so you take a needle filled with testosterone inject it your gonads go oh i've got heaps of testosterone here i don't need to make any negative feedback it switches off but because your testes need to make that testosterone and part of their function for growth and development is to create testosterone sometimes the testes in themselves can change their size Yes. Right? They can shrink a little bit because those cells that make the testosterone can atrophy. Yeah. Right? And so... And then also... That's the fe- negative the f- feedback. But also the, the, the releasing hormones as well that are going to the particular regions of the... So from, let's say, the hypothalamus pituitary gland that normally would oversee uh, testosterone release, they would also go, why are we so, why is this testosterone so high? Yeah. I better turn off. That's right. Because when you really think about it, it's not just at that place where that testosterone is released. That testosterone will act upon all the precursor or upstream regulators and will affect them. So that's why when you affect one hormone through a drug or intervention, it generally will affect a multitude of other things. Yeah. Because... the hormones in the endocrine system are very, they're a cascading system where it has a domino like effect, except both upstream and downstream. All right, before we jump into the specifics, I think we need to talk about the fact that some hormones, if you to again categorize hormones now by what they're made up of, so the, the chemical structure. Yep. Some are going to be made up of individual amino acids, mm-hmm. right? Or a single amino acid. So like tyrosine. Like tyrosine. Some are going to be made up of uh, multiple amino acids. So like peptides and polypeptides or proteins, usually between two to uh, three to 200 amino acids. And then you've got the steroid hormones, which are made up of cholesterol. Yep. Yep. And if you have a look at the amines, for example, so the amines are basically the uh, the hormones made up of tyrosine, the amino. So tyrosine is an amino acid. And tyrosine is the basis to create the catecholamines, which is uh, dopamine, yep. noradrenaline, and adrenaline, yep. which 
can all which are also hormones. Yeah. The neurotransmitters, the, but also hormones. Also the thyroid ones as well. Yes. So T three, T four. Yeah. Okay. So thyroid hormones are made up of tyrosine as well, but they're iodized. Yes. Yeah. But we'll talk. We'll talk about yeah. it. So that that's the amines. They've they've got a half life in the in the body once they're released of about two to three minutes. So what that means is the hormone after two to three minutes is 50% as effective as it was when it was first released. Wow. So very short acting, right? Except the thyroid hormone. When we talk about the amines, the thyroid hormone has a half-life of between half a day and seven days. Right. So f- for whatever reason, it could be because it's iodized, it could be because T4 is sort of like a stored version of thyroid hormone. Uh, it has a longer lasting half-life. If you look at the... I point wonder also, isn't the T3, T4 carried on a carrier molecule as well? Would that impact the way it's... Maybe. Maybe. Degraded? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. But I know most tissues have receptors for them and can many of the tissues can actually, in a way, store them themselves. Um, the polypeptides. Mm-hmm. So this is between three to 200 amino acids. Uh, this includes things like uh, insulin, glucagon, adrenocorticotropic hormone, even like gonadotropins, like luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating, hor- stimulating hormone. They're all uh, polypeptides, yeah. so multiple chains. Um, their half-life is between 4 to 40 minutes in the body. So again, not super long. Uh, and some of them have carbohydrates attached to them, some of the polypeptides. So for example, the luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, this is what we call the gonadotropins. So these are the hormones that have their effect in the uh, sex cells or um, the gonads of the males and females. Um, they have carbohydrates attached to them and that changes the way that they bind to receptors but also changes the way that they're targeted for degradation. Okay. As well. And then finally, the steroid hormones um, and the protein hormones together have a half-life of between 4 to 170 minutes. So they tend to last the longest outside of the thyroid hormones. Uh, the steroid hormones are made up of cholesterol, mm. and this mainly happens in the cortex and the gonads. Right, yep, yep. Um, and there's two major categories of steroid hormones. So you've got the corticosteroids, so they're the ones made in the cortex of the adrenal gland. And you've got the uh, sex steroids, which basically is like the androgens, the estrogens, and progesterone. So they're also made... So they're both made in the sex organs, but also in the uh, adrenal cortex, right? Yes, androgens. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now, the, the, we'll talk about the specifics of the corticosteroids when we get to the ad- sure. adrenal gland. Um, I think the other thing just to mention is by their nature, mm. then the way that they would interact on the target cell is going to be slightly different. So with the, Great point. With the amino acids and the proteins, because they are polar. What's in, that mean? Uh, charged, yep. they can't get through the membrane. So yeah, remember, if it's large or charged, it can't get into the cell freely. So when they come to the cell membrane, let's just say insulin comes to a muscle cell or a fat cell, they can't just barge their way through the cell membrane to, yeah. to tell the cell internally what to do. So the protein or the amino acid hormones need to have a receptor on the outside of the cell. And so these can be linked to other things so sometimes they're linked to a um, ion channel so that could be like a a ligand gated ion channel they could be coupled to a g protein or sometimes to uh, enzymes so i think using insulin still as an example i think that's a tyrosine kinase which is it phosphorylates a whole lot of things internally yeah which i think correct me if wrong here i think that then just either creates or just sends glute transporters to the top of the membrane to allow glucose to come in. Is that yeah. basically right? Yeah, to the surface. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, oh, do you have anything to add for the... No, no, that's okay. fine. That's fine. Yeah, so those, those uh, amine-based and peptide-based and protein polypeptide-based, they have their receptors on the surface. What about the steroid hormones? So they're in nature because they are acted on surface receptors. Oh, you're still talking about the... Yeah. Pro- yep, Just I mean, really quickly. Yeah, they're going to then have a fairly quick response Um in response to the hormone binding to it. Yes. So when you now come to the steroid hormones, Mm -hmm. because they are fat-soluble, like you said, cholesterol, they don't need to have a receptor on the outside because they can just squeeze their way through the membrane. Lipid-soluble. Lipid-soluble. So then they come into the cytoplasm 
and many of them will then encounter a receptor or some binding protein that they will jump onto, which then will take them like a spaceship yeah. into the nucleus, which then affects gene expression. Yeah, it finds what's called a promoter usually on the DNA and allows for it to either activate and transcribe more genes that can turn into proteins and have downstream effects or can inhibit depending on what it is. Yeah, um, I it think a good example for that one would be aldosterone. Yep. So aldosterone is produced in the adrenal cortex. It's a, a steroid based, it's from cholesterol. And so when it leaves the adrenal cortex, it will travel to the kidneys, I think primarily to the distal convoluted tubule, go into those cells that are lying in the tubule and changes the gene expression and makes more sodium potassium pumps. Yeah. And so that then changes the way that, that those cells handle salt, or should I just say sodium and potassium, yep. and that then allows more reabsorption of salt back into the water, back into the blood, yep. and therefore more water goes with it. And that's pretty much the function of aldosterone is yep. to hold on to salt and hold on to water. In the body. Don't let it pee out. Don't yep. pee out sodium. Don't pee out water. I'm dehydrated. My blood volume's low. Bring it back into the body, and that's how it works. All right, so we've covered that. Now I think we can get into the guts of it and we can start talking about the, if we talk about my SimCity analogy, yes. we can, we've got to start talking about the mayor. <laughs> we've got to talk about... Mayor Quimby. We're going to talk about... I did not. So we're going to talk about um, the mayor and the mayor in this case is the deity overriding figure that controls the, the whole, whole city. city. And in this case, it's the hypothalamus. Right. Matt, quickly, very quickly, where is the hypothalamus? Um, all right, so... In the brain, that's you how you can say it. All right. <laughs> no, no. Is there another way that you'd like to describe it? Well, the region, I guess you'd put it in, is a diencephalon. Yeah, that helps everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think the quickest way to get there. Uh, Probably with an ice pick <laughs> through <laughs> those. <laughs> there you go. That's done. actually how you do it. Okay. Um, corpus callosum, the top, what's the, the knee, the genu? Right. You can't, you can't describe it by using more technical, complex terms. Basically, it is if you take the brain under the brain towards the front, you've got the hypothalamus. Uh, it is a little outpocketing, little projection that you'll see, and it's a tiny little innocuous-looking B- structure. Below the thalamus, which are the eggs of the brain. Yeah, that helps people <laughs> as well. So the hypothalamus, its job is the mayor. It is the master regulator of the endocrine of system. The endocrine yeah. system. So, yeah. all right, the hypothalamus has a projection underneath it called the pituitary gland. Now, the pituitary gland actually has two lobes associated with it. Very interestingly, these lobes have different embryological origins. Mm. Very quickly, (laughs) the anterior lobe, also known as the adenohypophysis, which means gland under the hypothalamus, it is originated not from the brain. No. It originated from the ectoderm, from the roof of the mouth. What's the name of the pouch? Rathke's? Rathke's, yeah. So Rathke's pouch are at development. So basically, it came from non-neural tissue and projected up to attach to the hypothalamus. Correct. The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is a projection of the hypothalamus, so it's neural tissue. Mm. And the reason why we're highlighting this is because the way that the hypothalamus speaks to these two aspects of the pituitary gland is different. Right. So for the posterior, which is simply an extension of itself, it's just got neurons that connect yeah, so to it. So they're basically just neurotransmitters. That's right. Yep. For the anterior, because it had to connect to itself, it has a bloodstream that connects the two. Yeah. So if we start with the... Do you want to start with the anterior or posterior? We'll go posterior because there's only two hormones in there. All right. So... Because the hypothalamus connects to the posterior pituitary through um, neurons, they, the posterior pituitary, also known as the neurohypophysis, yeah. it doesn't produce its own hormones. The hypothalamus produces it for them, transports them down those neurons. Down the axon. Down the axon and says, hey, posterior pituitary, store these for me. I'll tell you when it's time to release them. So just vesicles of neurotransmitters sitting at the uh, end terminal and instead of going into another neuron or another structure, 
it then just gets put into a blood vessel yeah. which goes to the whole body. Yeah, but it needs to be stimulated to be released Correct. from the posterior. And so it's still the hypothalamus, the, the, the mare, that tells it when it needs to release it. Now, these two hormones are oxytocin mm -hmm. and antidiretic hormone. Yeah, or vasopressin. In the US, vasopressin. Because we don't call it vasopressin here no. in, in Australia, Australia land. <laughs> All right, so start with oxytocin. So oxytocin is uh, sounds like a, a washing detergent it that you you put into like to get stains out. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder how good oxytocin would be getting stains out. All right, let's let's. So when my wife was um, pregnant, embryo. oh sorry, no, pregnant with a developed embryo after about forty-one weeks, the fetus, right. <laughs> a fetus. Well, my, my daughter, daughter had about 41 weeks. It was time. 41? Yeah. It was... I would you. Yeah, well cooked. So we had to go into the hospital and my wife needed to become induced. Oh, okay. So they do a couple of things. So first you can sort of like tickle stretch the cervix. Stretch and sweep. Yeah, stretch and sweep, which basically irritates the cervix, right? Yeah. Um, you can put some prostaglandins on there, which we know from previous podcasts, prostaglandins... Um, <laughs> do a whole bunch of stuff, but they can irritate the area. And, and that's sometimes why they recommend intercourse. Yes. It's because semen has prostaglandins in it. Well, the prostate gland produces prostaglandins. Yeah. Uh, and yes, that semen could potentially irritate the cervix and say, it so is like time. Little submarines bashing into the cervix. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so we tried that. The prostaglandin <laughs> gel, the prostaglandin keep, gel. Keep it PG. Yes. Um, it didn't work. So my wife went on an oxytocin drip. And so this highlights quite nicely some of the functions of oxytocin. Oxytocin can tell the uterus to contract. She fell in love with you again. All right. So oxytocin, <laughs> she needed to fall in love with me in the first place. Oxy, oxytocin um, is, has people recognize it for having two main roles. The main role that you, you ask someone down the street, hey, what's oxytocin do? They go, oh, it's the love molecule. and Which is uh, true. Well, in a way it's true. Mm. It is a relationship or bonding, bonding yeah. molecule. It's not about just positive relationships. Oxytocin can solidify negative relationships as well. In humans, yes. Yes. But I think animals is much more bonding. Probably right. Yeah. Can I just add a yeah. story here? Okay. My dad, um, he grew up in a sheep farm in New Zealand. Okay. Did he f fall in love? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, um, he, he, would, he would say that um, when it is lambing season, which I think is... Is that what it's called, lambing season? Yeah, which is, I think is the end of winter. Right. I think. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, occasionally what would happen... Um, Mothers, Some of them came out and they had his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Mothers would die in the birthing process. Oh, no. Well, I'm glad that came off the back of what I said. That's horrible. I forget. That. It doesn't matter. Okay. So basically what happened was there were sometimes lambs that didn't have a mother. Okay. okay? And so what they would do... Wait. As in the mother gave birth to the lamb and then passed away for whatever yeah. reason. Okay. Yep. And so there would be lambs that needed... Um, caring right and so what they could do is a couple of things they could either get all the afterbirth and rub it all over the um the lamb right. and then from another mother who's given birth and that smell oh you take the afterbirth of another yeah, infant yeah. Yeah. that that mother gave birth to yeah, yeah. and put it on this quote-unquote foreign infant Correct. and then the mother would smell it and think it's its own yeah Right. Or sometimes also what would happen is if a mother has rejected her own lamb, yep. what they would do is um, if there had been a lamb that had died, they would kind of put the coat on, so they always skin it and they put that on there and then the smell would allow the, the mother to accept the, well, the lamb and not reject it. Wow. But I think in more recent times they are just using oxytocin. So if they, you know, done, they've done experiments... Again, I think mice and rats where if they were just to artificially inject the mothers mm. with higher amounts of oxytocin, they would start nesting and then they would accept uh, offspring that aren't theirs. Right. Mm. Okay. So 
It definitely is a bonding. Yeah, but molecule. I think that is possibly reversed in humans and that's what I think you'll get into. Yeah, so th- there have been studies that have shown that uh, oxytocin will be released in relatively high amounts when you've got uh, people um, solidifying negative relationships with others. So sort of um, having negative thoughts, negative connotations, really solidifying somebody's hatred for somebody else. Oxytocin tends to play a role in that, but also in the bonding relationship with a mother and a child. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because oxytocin is released during that birthing process and continues to be released during that process as well. Because oxytocin... One of its major roles um, is smooth muscle contraction. Mm. And this smooth muscle can include the uterus to help push the child out during labor, but also contraction of the muscle of the mammary tissue to help milk ejection, Yep, to get milk out when the baby is suckling. So if the baby suckles... That's a letdown uh, reflex. Oh, okay. Are they gonna <laughs> no, say? not you let down the baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> You so when the when the baby is suckling at the nipple, that stimulates to the hypothalamus. Neurologically, neurologically, the hypothalamus will stimulate through that neural innervation, the posterior oxytocin. pituitary gland, yeah. to release oxytocin, and that contracts the muscle tissue surrounding the milk. Yeah. The milk is ejected, yeah. and simultaneously, the release of that oxytocin at the time of breastfeeding solidifies your relationship with the infant. Yeah. So sense. it's this twofold, you know. Effect and um and I guess in both in these examples that you provided they would be positive feedback and so yes. where if you remove the stimulus I think the better one to, to illustrate this is the birth the birthing yeah. process so the head of the baby is pushed on the cervix which is causing a stretching stimuli which neurologically goes back up to the hypothalamus and tells the hypothalamus, we need small oxytocin down here to push the baby out. Yep. And this keeps reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing until there's no more stimulus and that's hopefully the head's gone. Yeah. Well, not the head, but the baby. <laughs> yeah. You need to be very, very particular with the terms you use, Matt. Um, yes, until there's no stimulus of the head stretching the cervix. And I'll add one story uh, to add on to yours. <laughs> when my wife, Sabine, in, her last, in our last baby... Yep. Um, she had quite a significant bleed. And right. so uh, baby was fine, but placenta wasn't detaching completely. Yep. And so she lost over a litre of Whoa. blood. And so the um, an emergency kind of obstetrician came in and they put oxytocin on the drip plus another, th- another drug, I'm not sure what it was. And the obstetrician literally was just pushing her uterus from through the abdomen as hard as they could wow. because that would, again, be stimulating neurologically to release more oxytocin and right. that would then... Tighten everything up. Tighten everything up and stop the, the bleeding. Wow. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah. I think they, they do a similar thing with a prolapse uterus. Um, okay, so let's move on from oxytocin. The other hormone is from the, that's released from the posterior pituitary is ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. So anti meaning opposing, diuretic means to uh, release excessive water uh, or just to release water, hormone. So it's stopping the release of water from the body. And obviously the kidneys are the primary organ that help filter the blood and release that water from the body. So this is where ADH acts. The question is why would you want to hold on to water? And I think it's a pretty simple reason is due to times of dehydration or low blood volume levels yeah or a high uh, osmolarity oh good point so if you've got a lot of things dissolved in your blood that is an, in, an indication that you might be dehydrated yeah. because if you think about it if you've got a bucket filled with salt right yeah, so if you drink salty water like a no, no, no. Let me do this analogy okay, first. Right. If you've got a bucket filled with salt and you were to only take... So a bucket with a litre of water with, let's just say, a kilogram of salt in it. If you were to take half a litre of just the water out, you are going to have a higher concentration of that solute in the water, right? You haven't actually changed the number of those solutes, those salt particles, but you've changed the water. And you've changed the concentration. So the body thinks that if you've got a higher uh, concentration of things dissolved in it, that you're dehydrated. 
But that may not be the reason. You may not be dehydrated. You may have just had too many chips, for example, mm-hmm. and that's going to tell you, oh, I need more water to dilute this out. So the ADH is released from the posterior pituitary and it goes to the kidneys. Now, remember, the kidneys filter blood. This uh, filtrate travels through these convoluted tubes. Specifically, they're called convoluted tubes. And we pull 99% of whatever it filters back into the body. And then we'll pee out around about two liters per day of water, solutes, wastes, and so forth. ADH will travel to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. Collecting duct, so think, the yeah. very end yeah. of it. And it inserts these little pores called aquaporins, these little proteins that allow for water to just be pulled back out. Does it instruct it just to bring it up from the cytoplasm up to the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think... um, uh, Yes, that's right. And then the water will go from the tubules back Back into the the body and you don't pee it out. And that's that role of ADH. Yep. Right? Uh, Anything you'd like to add there? Or just issues that could go wrong with the ADH is in... In two ways. So either too much ADH is released or not a love. Not, not a, not not a love. love. You're back on oxytocin. Not yeah, not enough. <laughs> so right. these two conditions would be if you're producing too much ADH, that would be syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Yeah. So that could be from uh, head injuries or, or brain surgery or something. Yeah. And that causes a hypersecretion of ADH. So too much holding onto water. Yeah. And so then the person would retain too much water yeah and then they'd have those osmolarity uh fluctuations yeah and you could have a lot of neurological effects if yep. your ions are not in the right concentration and then the opposite one is a form of diabetes but it's diabetes insipidus which means I don't know watery something like that the amount of times that we've because mellitus is this. is honey yes. diabetes means like to pass or to siphon Insipidus, I'm, I'm thinking is clear or, yeah, it doesn't matter. But essentially in this case, because you're not producing any ADH. Tasteless. Tasteless. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because diabetes mellitus means taste sweet. Diabetes insipidus means it has no taste. So it's saying, oh, it's not a glucose thing. It's not a pancreas thing. It's because diabetes was originally defined by the fact that the, the person with it passed a lot of... Polyuria. Yeah, passed yeah. a lot of urine. And so this is also passing a lot of urine. So they called it diabetes. But it's a totally separate origin. It's got nothing mm-hmm. to do with glucose, nothing to do with insulin, nothing to do with the pancreas. Correct. Yeah. And so in these individuals, you could be passing up to 20 litres of urine a day. Oh, And so then you have obviously dehydration issues. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay, now let's talk about the anterior pituitary. This is, like I said, also known as the edema hypothesis. It does produce its own hormones and stores it, but still waits for the hypothalamus to tell it to release those hormones. But because we said that there's a bloodstream called the hypophyseal portal system that sits between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, it means the hypothalamus needs to release its own hormones to travel through that bloodstream to stimulate the anterior pituitary. Yeah, yeah. So this is a hormonal stimulus. With the posterior pituitary, that's a neural stimulus, right? We spoke about those because we're very good at preparing you to understand what we're talking about. Hopefully. All right. So... There are six hormones that are stored and released by the anterior pituitary. Those oh, actually. Oh, okay. How is your analogy here now? Uh, yeah, well. Are you going to bring this in? Maybe later. Oh, maybe right. later. Maybe later. Maybe later. So we'll get, it, we'll get there in a sec. Um, the anterior pituitary has six hormones. Let's talk about those hormones first. You've got adrenocorticotropic hormone. Horrible name, but it actually tells you... Exactly where it does. So adreno. Adrenal gland. Cortico. Cortex of the adrenal gland. Tropic. To grow. Well, it's... Or to simulate. To tell that... To do something. Next gland to release its hormone. Mm. Hormone. So it's going to the adrenal gland, the cortex specifically, to tell it to release a hormone, and it can stimulate the release of a number of hormones. Um, but let's talk about that when we get to the adrenal gland. So that's ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, number one. Number two, growth hormone. Yeah. Growth stuff. I think it, this one's also called somatotrophin. Yep. Mm. Yep. Which just means body growth. Body growth. Right? Um, the th- third one, and again, this is no particular order, this is the gonadotropins, and there's actually two here, so this would be three and four. 
which is luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And they're both named after what they do in the female reproductive system, but they're equally important in the male reproductive system as well. Yes. So there's four. The fifth is going to be prolactin, which stimulates lactation. Mm. So this is the production of milk, not the letdown, not the ejection. Mm. That's what oxytocin does, but the production. And then the sixth one is thyroid thyroid stimulating hormone that goes to the thyroid to stimulate it to be released. Now, the hypothalamus must release hormones to stimulate each of these. We're not going to go through those because I don't think there's much point, but each one of those hormones released from the anterior pituitary has an equivalent stimulatory hormone from the hypothalamus. So, for example... Except two. Which ones? Well, they're inhibitory rather than stimulating. Okay, let's do the stimulatory one. Yeah. So or hi- releasing. Or re- yeah, you could go stimulating, that's fine. Okay, so the hypothalamus will release uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Yep. That goes down to the anterior pituitary, yep. stimulates luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone to be released. Um, the hypothalamus uh, will release uh, growth hormone-releasing uh, hormone. Inhibiting. Inhibiting hormone. Growth hormone, inhibiting hormone. Yeah, that's right. And it inhibits the release of growth hormone. Correct. So okay. without that inhibition, yep. you'll just produce growth hormone. Okay. So what about when the hypothalamus releases dopamine to go for prolactin? Is that inhibitory for prolactin? Yes, yes. Right. So dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin. So again, without the hypothalamic signal, prolactin will continually be released. Correct. All right. That's important. Um, I wonder what that... Okay. We'll get back to there in a sec. Um We've got um, the – now what triggers uh, – we've got uh, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Uh, so Or just corticoreleasing hormone. That's it, corticoreleasing hormone. Mm. That stimulates the release of ACTH, yep. adrenocorticotropic hormone. What am I missing here? Thyroid. Thyroid, again. Um, and this is thyrotropin – or no, thyroid stimulant. Thyroid Re- releasing hormone. Yes. Yep. I always bugger this up. Thyroid – Releasing hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay. Yes. And that stimulates the release of thyrotropin, also known as thyroid stimulating hormone. That's right. Hopefully we haven't confused people any further. That's why I didn't want to go through it. But now we've got those six hormones from the anterior pituitary. Which one do you want to start with? We'll start growth with hormone. we'll start with the growth hormone, All right. I reckon. Yeah. All right. Growth hormone, because I think it's pretty simple. Growth hormone is released from the anterior pituitary gland and its job is to grow stuff. Right. <laughs> so one. So basically, what it does is, um, it, growth hormone will stimulate the release of something called insulin-like growth factor one. Right. So insulin-like growth factor one basically promotes cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation of tissues of the body, primarily for children and adolescents. Yeah. So very important in development, early development, um, but also for adults as well, mobilizes the breakdown of triglycerides in adipose tissue. So you release energy, quote unquote, energy into the bloodstream to be used for growth and development. It reduces glucose uptake into those adipocytes because it doesn't want to store energy there. So it says, hey, don't jump into um, fat cells. But it does say, hey, jump into muscle cells because I need, we need this energy to grow muscles. And, and so also protein... Uh, formation, right? Yep, stimulates protein synthesis as well within the muscle tissue and also stimulates osteoblasts mm-hmm. and collagen synthesizing um, uh, factors, right? which both are connective tissue. Yeah. So stimulates the growth of connective tissue, bone and other types of connective tissue. So really important in that growth and development. If you have too much growth hormone... just So like this would be, going to the analogy of SimCity, yep. this would be the building developers of the town yeah or the city yeah. so these are those um that business that is basically just building a crap load of big buildings mm. if you build or just buildings if you build build too big things are going to not be able to so who was in, in history who was the tallest man to live was it still robert wadlow yeah there we go yeah so as an example so he had a tumor which I guess was not releasing the inhibit, inhibiting hormone, mm. which then meant growth hormone was left uninhibited. But he could have potentially also had it in the anterior pituitary, which stimulated true, more yes. growth hormone, okay. which is what I Pro- think he which had. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. So he's producing a huge amount of growth hormone. Yeah. And so because he is in childhood, the big difference here is that 
all his growth plates in his long bones are open. Yes. And so that means they just keep long lengthening. Yeah, so basically his body grew significantly but evenly. So he just looked like a giant person. Correct. But so, if this so, happens as an adult. So just some, I think this is off my head. Yeah. As an eight-year-old, yeah. he was taller than his dad. Yeah. As a 12-year-old, he was six foot seven. Right. And then I think at the point of him dying, which wasn't that old, I think he was in his 20s or yes. something. I think he just hit 30. Yeah. He was almost nine foot. Wow. Did you know there's a person in history, and I wish I could remember the name so for the listener, the only person in history to both be defined medically as having dwarfism and also having gigantism. So when this person was younger, uh, they had something that inhibited growth hormone being released. I think it was a tumor that inhibited growth hormone being released. And they were something like four foot up until they were like 18, 19, 20. And then the tumor like flipped Reversed. in a way. and pumped out a bunch of growth hormone and then grew to be like seven and a half, eight foot. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Amazing, right? So it was, they're the only person to have been both on either ends of the spectrum. Wow. Um, so uh, growth hormone, obviously very important for that growth and development and obviously both ends of the spectrum if you don't have enough undergrowth, too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do think... Um, dwarfism is slightly different. I think that yes, I was just going to say is genetic, right? But so I think it's also there's a connected tissue difference at the growth plate, which just kind of closes it prematurely, opposed yeah. to a growth hormone issue. Yeah. Now going to the other thing that could happen with growth hormone would be if you've already reached puberty. Yep. And it, well, not puberty, but you've kind of passed the point that the growth plates have closed. And then you were to add growth hormone excessively into your body, right? The long bones don't have the ability to lengthen anymore because the long bones are closed. Right. And so, what happens is the growth hormone, if you're looking at the bone side of things, it will only allow growth at the tips of the bones. Yes. And this is what the term actually means. Agromegaly. Acro yeah. agro, agro means, or acro, acro, acro like a chromium. Yeah. The tip. That's the chromium is the tip of your shoulder, but the tips, so the tips of your bones will grow. And so this is where these individuals get really big hands and jaws, protruding jaw, yeah, uh, like eyebrow ridges. I think they're maybe they're forehead. Yeah. They, and so they um, develop it that way. So this, if this goes back to your city, city analogy, mm. this would be kind of inappropriate development that is kind of not just tall but the building structures grow outwards yeah which then make it quite dangerous yeah exactly so hypo and hyper pituitaryism is i believe what this individual had both hypo in the early stages and then hyper in the later stages okay leading to under growth hormone and overgrowth hormone uh dear listener if you can find out this person's name and correct me if I've got the medical conditions wrong, that would be awesome. All right, so that's growth hormone. What we've got now is uh, let's do ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. This hormone is released and travels to the adrenal gland, specifically the cortex, which is the out a few millimeters of the um, adrenal gland, and stimulates the release of cortisol and aldosterone. Mostly cortisol. Mostly cortisol. Yeah, because aldosterone release... Because this is the interesting part. So when you go to the, cortis, the, cor the cortex of the adrenal gland, yep. the precursor for the, all these three hormones, which are going to be aldosterone, yep. cortisol, cortis, cortisol, and uh, the androgens, yep. they're all cholesterol-based. Okay. Okay. Now, it almost works in a way that cholesterol kind of comes in at the top and like a percolator, as the cholesterol is getting modified it's kind of filtering through the cortex and going deeper, right? Right. And so what happens is as they're kind of getting modified, they, they leave out of the cortex at different points. And so whatever's left is there that's f for availability to make the next one. And then In a way. Yep. And so the cortisol, sorry, the, the cholesterol gets modified kind of into precursors of progesterone. Right. Okay. And then that can be modified by a number of other enzymes into... 
uh, aldosterone. Yeah. And then that progesterone or similar precursors to it can then filter through and then that can be modified off into cortisol. I think we did an episode of yeah, steroids, right? And then yeah. it goes into these kind of early phase of an androgen, testosterone-like, and it can be modified into testosterone or estrogen. Yes. But this will probably not normally just happen regardless of hormone stimulation, but then if you stimulate it with ACTH, then you're bumping up the process to go more down the line of cortisol. Right. But then if you b- stimulate the adrenal cortex with angiotensin 2, then you're pumping out more aldosterone. All right. So let's just say now um, we are in a state of stress, right? Fight or flight. Something's happened. I'm scared. I'm stressed. I've got a deadline at work. I need to get it done. I've got that feeling, that stressed feeling. This feeling of stress is intrinsically linked to the amygdala, is linked to various areas of the brain that can speak to the hypothalamus, triggering ultimately the release of adrenal corticotropic hormone, which travels to the bloodstream to the adrenal gland, stimulating the release of cortisol. Everyone has heard that cortisol is our stress hormone. Now, what this means is, and I don't know if, did we do an episode on cort? We did an episode on stress and cortisol, I think. But anyway, remember the fact that cortisol, this is important for people to understand, Cortisol doesn't make you stressed. No. Cortisol is released as a result from your stress. Well, it's released throughout the day. That's right. So it's, it's got diurnal. A, say it again. Diurnal. Diurnal. It's released early in the morning and then... It, in kind of pulses. Yes. But I think the greatest pulse or pulsatile release is early morning to prepare you for the day because That's you right. need more energy, you need more, um, you know, glucose... Um, utilization and release and so forth yeah so, all right so let's talk about what cortisol does then because co- like you said cortisol is released because uh not because it wants to make you stressed but it wants you to be in the best position physiologically to respond to the stress so that's how you should be thinking about it but in my mind i say cortisol helps our body deal with the stress in the immediate moment mm-hmm. but also helps future proof the body for future stress and the reason why I say that is because a couple of things that happen is this. It stimulates the uh, muscles to undergo glyco, uh, uh, glycogenolysis, which is breaking down glycogen into glucose so the muscle can use the glucose to do stuff. Mm-hmm. That's important because if you're stressed, you need to be able to do things, get work done, run away, whatever it may be. But it also goes to the liver and tells the liver to do the opposite, not break things down, but store the glucose as glycogen. And it wants to store the glucose as glycogen for future reasons, right? To future-proof it so that it's there. It also goes to fat tissue, tells it to break the fat down into... Lipolysis. Yeah, yeah, lipolysis and breaks the fatty acids down so they can jump into the bloodstream again so we can use it for energy. And so, you know, depending on the tissue and its function, it depends on what it does. It goes to, uh, well, speaks interacts with the immune system, tells some aspects of the immune system to ramp up, other ones to bump down. Again, it's saying we don't need to waste time and energy on the immune system right now. Yep. But, so for example, what it can do is say, hey, you don't need to undergo inflammatory resp- responses. That's very energy, um, uh, highly energy costing. Let's save that. Let's push that down and we'll put, put our energy elsewhere, Right. And so that's how you should think about cortisol. And also bone. So it changes the model in the bone, yep. presumably to um, liberate calcium ions. Yes, because we need calcium for muscle contraction. Yep. And, and also... Neuron firing. And also the way it kind of regulates homeostasis in the skin, particularly uh, kind of repair in the connective tissue aspect of it. So that could potentially thin the skin off if it's around for too long. And that's the other thing is that just like with the SimCity analogy, you don't want to amplify anything more than you need to. So cortisol, people think it's a negative thing or a bad thing because some of us always feel stressed. Therefore, the cortisol release for too long can actually significantly modulate the immune system to the point that we can get sick. Mm. It can significantly impact our bones and we can actually get more brittle bones. It can significantly impact the way that we 
deal and handle glucose and you could possibly alter your insulin sensitivity and get metabolic disease and so forth. So this is the reason why. It's mm. not because insulin's doing anything wrong. It's a great, it, it is such a wonderful hormone and is required, but it's required to help us deal with stress in the moment. Mm. And that's important. And that's because of ACTH. A moment. So welcome back. Uh, we've spoken about ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, the fact that it's released from the anterior pituitary gland in response to the hypothalamus stimulating it, and the fact that it travels via the bloodstream to the adrenal gland, specifically the cortex, to stimulate the release of cortisol. And we spoke about the effects of cortisol. But there are other important functions of ACTH that I think our dear listener needs to be aware of, Maddie. But also the adrenal gland has a number of other hormones that it releases that we should probably touch upon. So firstly, I want to say that ACTH is actually produced, interestingly, from this sort of pro-hormone. Uh, and this is called pro-iopo, sorry, pro-opio-melanocortin. Pro-opio. Pumps. Sorry? Pumps. That's right. Or pompk. Pompk. Yeah. Pro-opio-melanocortin. Interestingly, it's basically a molecule that gets chopped up to produce big ACTH. Big peptide, right? Big peptide. Chopped up, produces ACTH. It also gets chopped up to produce something called MSH, specifically alpha MSH. And that's a melanocyte stimulating hormone. And its job is to stimulate melanocytes. What do melanocytes do? Uh, they provide the... The reason why Matt doesn't know is because it doesn't subs. possess it. Yeah, that's right. Well, I do have them, but they're just not very efficient. Yeah, they so don't I, I mustn't have this hormone at all then that's right they <laughs> stimulate these melanocytes to produce pigment and this pigment molecular sunscreen michael you could call it a molecular sunscreen i call it an melanin. umbrella for the cell <laughs> uh, and melanin and that's what msh does msh being made from the same pro hormone that acth is tells us something because acth can because it's such a similar chemical bind to the same receptors that MSH binds to on the melanocyte to stimulate it. Now, generally, it's a very poor stimulator of the melanocytes, ACTH, but in high quantities, it can stimulate the melanocytes to produce all this pigment and can result in hyperpigmentation. Right. So in cases of too much ACTH being released, you can get hyperpigmentation. Now, do you know any conditions where ACTH is released at high quantities? Yeah, I guess the... The two well-known ones would be uh, Cushing's and Addison's. Cushing's and Addison's. So yeah. these are conditions, diseases, disorders associated with increased ACTH. Yep. Yeah. So in uh, Addison's, mm -hmm. which... Um, Can you call it Addison's? Yeah. You made a Mayor Quimby joke earlier on. And uh, now we're... Because Mayor Quimby <laughs> was... His character is based off JFK. Right, okay. And JFK had Addison's. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say... The common clinical scenario or study used for Addison's is JFK. Yep. Right. And I think he had like a, a bronzy coloured skin. He did. Hard to tell because all the footage is black and white, but yes. <laughs> okay. So with him, so with Addison's, essentially what, what the issue is, is adrenal insufficiency. Right. And so what's happening there Not is... Not adrenal fatigue. No. Which doesn't exist. Okay. Just, just to make sure because... Oh, you, do you just mean like it gets worn out or something? Yeah, there is a condition that people, which again, doesn't exist, that people call adrenal fatigue, where they go, oh, I'm so tired, I've got lethargy, my hormones aren't working properly, because okay. I've been yeah. so stressed all the time that my adrenal gland is just so tired and fatigued, it doesn't release the hormones it needs to. If that doesn't exist. Uh, you can have adrenal insufficiency where yep. there's an actual, which you're going to talk about, which is a pathology, mm -hmm. which something has happened structurally or functionally to stop. Yeah. from working properly or maybe even iatrogenically itrog so if you were what does that mean about well, drugs usually healthcare driven yeah and so in this case would be if you had been on long-standing steroids for long periods of time that your adrenal gland may become down regulated yeah because you've and then this goes back to feedback loops and in this case this is the hormonal feedback loop so if you've got a lot of cortisol in your blood because you're taking prednisone or other things similar then the feedback loops would be to negative inhibit these. That's right. Because the body's thinking, why do I have such a high amount? Yeah, it's not fatigued. It's not tired. And so if you were to go off it quickly, then you would have a 
it wouldn't rebound. be fatigued. It would just be insufficient. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's just get back to this. You said JFK had Addison's, which is too much ACTH. Oh, the the issue there is that because at the adrenal gland there's an insufficiency, so it's just not releasing cortisol. So you're saying that ACTH is probably being released in a normal ish amount to yeah. begin with. Yeah. But when it goes to the adrenal gland, it's almost like the adrenal gland is non-responsive to it. Correct. And so, so, as we know with the feedback loops, if there's no cortisol to feedback negatively to the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, therefore it's going, we need some more, obviously. And right. So it just keeps ramping it up and so high ACTH. So, it's not a problem a at the pituitary or hypothalamus. It's a problem with not Correct. picking it up properly. So, in Addison's, they don't have enough cortisol. And so, you're going to see downstream effects of not having enough Cortisol, I assume. Yeah. So what could that potentially be? Well, if I guess if you just go to what cortisol does, and we spoke, um, it has the metabolic effects. Yeah. So it would, uh, what's the term? Utilize, not utilize, but release um, from various locations of the body for glucose to be available. Yeah. Um, immune function, vascular function, um, other things in, in the kind of stress response. And so if you're not... And then po- possibly the earlier stages of how cortisol is made is aldosterone. And so you're going to have similar... Because if you've got a insufficiency of those two hormones, yep. cortisol and aldosterone... Which ACTH can stimulate both, can't it? Well, More so cortisol. It, yeah, mostly can. cortisol because aldosterone, which we'll get to, is more driven... Release is more driven by uh, angiotensin 2. Yep. But because the ACTH would drive the cortisol, which then drives the precursor, it would still feed back on aldosterone release. Yeah. And so presumably a person with uh, Addison's would have issues with both the cortisol not being high enough and also aldosterone. So that would be fluid balance. Yeah, so they can have hypotension, right? Somebody. So basically you can say that Addison's is a hypocortisolism. Right? Yep. And so they don't have enough cortisol. And like you said, cortisol is important for mobilizing the glucose into the bloodstream for us to use for energy. So if that's not happening, then you may be fatigued. Yeah. Low and, on energy. and also going with cortisol, which we spoke about, that it kind of sensitizes the body to the catecholamines. So the, Good point. the fight and flight. Not to say that you want to be in a fight and flight response, but it just makes it more sensitive too. So um, keeping your heart rate, blood pressure, all those kind of things responsive to those hormones. Yeah. Um, that would be a, an issue as well. And so because that ACTH, so again, low cortisol, the effects in Addison's is going to be low cortisol. Again, weakness, um, you're going to have uh, dysregulation of your blood pressure, you're going to have dysregulation of your immune system. And sugars. Sugars even. are going to be off, all that type of stuff. But we were talking about ACTH because it's now elevated because of the negative feedback. You can get hyperpigmentation, yeah. right? Now, the other uh, disorder associated with elevated ACTH is Cushing's. Yeah, so now this is not by the same process, but this is actually probably from a tumour in the pituitary gland. And so this is directly stimulating ACTH, ACTH from being released. So but it's not a negative feedback issue. It's just, hey, hypersecret- pump, pump Hypersecretory. Right. And so then, because the adrenal gland will be responding to it, unlike Addison's, now you are also pumping out, or well, sorry, now you are pumping out huge amounts of cortisol, and now you get in an effect of hypercortisolemia. Yeah. So you can have primary Cushing's, which is the tumor at the pituitary, or you can have, is it secondary when the no, tumor is no. at the adrenal gland? So that's a good point. So these definitions come based on which is secreting which. Yeah. So primary endocrine disorders is at the organ level of the secretion of the hormone. Okay. Okay. So to be to be a cortisol here. So to be a primary endocrine disease for cortisol, yeah, it has to have hypersecretion at the adrenal gland. Gotcha. Okay. But if it's going to be a secondary, then it's at the Pituitary. trophin releasing point. The so that would be ACTH. Gotcha. Yeah. So, whereas if it's tertiary. It's at the hypothalamus. Okay. So to clarify, for people who think the way I think, which is more slowly, uh, you might look at both Cushing's and Addison's, or let's say Addison's and Cushing's, as both having elevated ACTH. 
and that can be true. But the end product is cortisol, ultimately, and some aldosterone, but let's just focus on cortisol. Because in Addison's, the problem is ACTH isn't stimulating the adrenal gland. And or the adrenal gland is just problematic. So you've got adrenal yeah. insufficiency. Yeah. You've got low cortisol output. Correct. Right? And that low cortisol leads to more ACTH being produced. Yeah. But it's not a problem with the ACTH release. When you look at Cushing's, you're going to have a problem with either too much ACTH being released due to a pituitary tumour yeah. Yeah. or you're going to have too much cortisol being released due to an adrenal tumour. And because mm-hmm. the problem here in Cushing's is too much cortisol, you've got hypercortisolism, which is the opposite of Addison's, which is hypo. Now, because the problem is cortisol, ultimately, if the tumor's at the cortisol-producing tissue, that's primary. Yep. But it, could, but it can also be a high, hypo-secreting one as well, which right. would be Addison's. Which would be Addison's, yeah. yeah. So Addison te- is technically it. a primary, yeah. Yep. If it's a hypo-releasing, yep. Um, uh, and then we go back because you confuse me then we go back to the pituitary gland and if the tumor is there to release more ACTH then it's going to be secondary and if it's a hypothalamus even higher up it's a tertiary yeah. all right and so and so cushions would be a secondary yes generally right uh, because it's at the pituitary level most commonly yeah, yeah. all right aldosterone because aldosterone is also a hormone released from the adrenal gland right and ACTH can stimulate it, particularly at, at, at normal physiological levels, not really, but at super physiological levels, ACTH can definitely release, stimulate the release of aldosterone. And it, I just wonder, I don't know the answer to this, but yeah. this is just me working back from first principles. As we spoke about earlier, that um, the adrenal cortex is just like a percolating coffee machine. Mm-hmm. If you're kind of sucking out the coffee at a lower level, yeah you still need to bring more in at the top. Yep. And so, therefore, you're going to, by default, produce... And which did you say top. was produced first, the cortisol? No, the, the uh, aldosterone. Okay. Yeah. So, if you're really stimulating the cortisol, yeah. by default, you're also going to be producing aldosterone because yeah. they're similar molecules. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And so, I think that is definitely what's going to be happening in this case. So, when you've got too much ACTH being released, aldosterone is released, but... Let's just talk but about also, but also just a, a tumor in the adrenal gland in the yes. cortex. But let's talk about before we go into disease disorder of to r- release all this aldosterone. Aldosterone is released uh, under normal physiological conditions uh, in response to alterations in blood pressure, blood volume, and so aldosterone is truly there as a way to maintain our fluid balance. And so, if at the end of the day, the way I think about it and the way I talk about it with my students is that your blood volume is intrinsically linked to your blood pressure and your blood pressure must be maintained at around about 120 systolic over 80 mm. diastolic. And this is you know, the nice, good, roundabout, perfect pressure to be able to deliver enough blood to the tissues of our body to feed it so that we survive. That's why we need a pressure because it's the pushing force to say, here you go, organs, here's your oxygen, here's your glucose, here's your gases. Mm-hmm. But uh, the thing is that if your blood pressure drops and your tissues don't get perfused, well, there's a bit of buffering capacity. Your blood pressure can drop lower and it can still get that stuff. But the problem is at your kidneys. Because if your blood pressure drops to 80, to, to 80 systolic, then you're not going to be filtering as much blood. And you need to filter the blood to get rid of all the metabolic waste and filtering. byproducts. Yeah, so, and, and that's important because very quickly, if you're not filtering enough blood, those products accumulate, you get sick very quick. So your kidneys are probably very sensitive early on to changes in blood volume and changes in blood pressure. So they have evolved mechanisms to control blood pressure and blood volume. And so blood volume, blood pressure drops. Your kidneys release renin. It undergoes the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We've done a whole podcast mm. on that. Ultimately, it releases something called angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 yeah, yeah. is the trigger to stimulate aldosterone release from the adrenal gland. Yes. So that's telling us that primarily aldosterone doesn't get released, unlike all the other hormones we've spoken about today, from the hypothalamus and pituitary. It's mainly a kidney-controlled response. Angiotensin 2. Yeah. It releases aldosterone, travels to, back to the kidneys, specifically those nephrons that do the filtration, 
that will decide how much fluid and waste and products and particulates and solutes it wants to hold on to or throw back into the body and just tell it to throw more salt or sodium back into the blood yeah. and wherever salt goes, water follows. Yeah. And that's always think about that. When you, when you eat a lot of salty chips, you get thirsty. If you take a lot of the salt and throw it from one cell or tissue or, or um, compartment to another, water's going to follow. And that's the same thing. So if we throw the salt or sodium back into the blood and not pee it out, then we don't pee the water out because it follows the salt back into the body. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And so you can have too much aldosterone being produced. So what would that then tell you? What, what do you think would be the issue here? Yeah, well, it would just be high blood pressure, essentially, yeah. right? Blood volume goes up yeah. too high. And you can obviously get and maybe edema. Yeah, 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 yeah. Additional salt. That's right. Retention. Yeah, and obviously the opposite would be dehydration-associated effects. Yeah. You just pee out way too much fluid. And that's aldosterone. It would be interesting to see the comparison between a, a hypoaldosteremia versus... Like oh, emia in the blood. Yeah, versus yeah. Uh, diabetic insipidus. Like yeah. which one's more powerful? At, right, um, because what you're saying is ADH because we know that if does you, a similar role to aldosterone. Yeah. The only difference between the two is ADH is just making water carriers, yep. whereas aldosterone is making... Pumps. Pumps. Yeah. And so I think aldosterone would have a bigger effect on electrolyte management because it's not just taking more sodium back into the body and water follows, it's also excreting more potassium. potassium yeah. So you can become hypokalemic. Yeah. And that would be a problem. Oh, so yeah, because we need potassium at appropriate levels in the body. <clears throat> body's very sensitive to potassium changes. And potassium is required for neurons to function, for muscles to contract, for a yeah. whole range of things. And that's so. where, you know, some people who are on diuretics if they are losing too much potassium, they may have to shift to a potassium sparing. What's a diuretic? Diuretic is just a pee in drug. Sorry? A drug that makes you pee a lot. Why would you take that? Well, edema or yeah. in some cases high blood pressure. Right. There'd, there'd be other indications, but there are two common reasons for why you take a diuretic. So the thought is if your blood pressure is really high, well, we know blood pressure, like we stated before, is really closely linked to blood volume. Let's yep. just pee out more water and drop our blood volume and our blood pressure will drop. Correct. So let's do that by giving tablets that make you pee more. Yeah. But one of the side so effects the of that is you pee out too much potassium, potassium with it. So that would be like loop diuretics such as furosemide or thiazides. They will result in potassium loss. So you can take potassium sparing, did you say? Potassium sparing diuretics, right. which would work uh, in a different part of the nephron and hold on to the potassium and therefore you're not losing potassium, but you're still peeing stuff out like spirolactone. Yes. Okay. Um, wonderful. All right. So that is aldosterone. You mentioned it earlier. I just want to finish off the adrenal gland with its name. Adrenal. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more Greek, isn't it? Yeah. Ad is Greek for on. Renal is kidney. Whereas I think the Latin would be... Epi epinephron. Epinephros. Yeah. So epi meaning uh, around or uh, near to, nephros being kidney. Hence why adrenaline yeah. is produced from the kidneys and epinephrine is also produced from the kidneys and they're synonymous. Yes. It's just that in Australia where we say things correctly, <laughs> we say adrenaline and in the US, which is interesting, where they've got that, those funny accents in the US, don't they? Howdy, partner. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this is it inappropriate? We're going to lose. We've got a lot listeners. of friends in the US. We're going to lose listeners. Uh, dear listeners, we're joking. We're joking. In the US, uh, we love the US and we love our US listeners. Uh, and tell us where you're from. Uh, actually, send us an email if you're from the US and you listen to us and you enjoy what we uh, what the content that we put out. Tell us where in the US we're fr you're from, and Matt and I will try our best to do that accent. Boston. Hey, get out of here, you, 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 you man. <laughs> Was that all right? Anyway, um, well, who says forget about it? Is that the, that's uh, New York? I think it's New York. I'm walking here. Yeah, that was a funny video, that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you showed me that. Anyway, uh, we digress. What were you saying before that? Uh, go go st a step back. I was uh, going to oh, add yeah. something. Adrenal. 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 Adrenaline. It's, adrenal gland. It's interesting that, uh, yes, in the States, they'll say epinephrine. Yeah. 
But then when the receptor, what's the receptor called? Adrenergic. Yeah. Not epinephr- epinephric. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. See, full short. Yeah, it does. Full short, doesn't it, guys? Time uh, to change. Time to change. Agreed. And the metric system. <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, so the reason why I wanted to say that wasn't just to talk about uh, noradrenaline, uh, sorry, adrenaline and um, epinephrine, but obviously Matt spoke about earlier the fact that it's produced and released from this gland because the adrenal gland is simply a modified what? Oh, the adrenal medulla is. Yes, yeah. uh, but that's where noradrenaline and yeah, epinephrine yeah, yeah. is produced. It's just a modified pre post ganglionic neuron, yeah. cluster of neurons. That's right. And the reason why we brought it up again is because I just wanted to make the statement that when you are in a fight or flight response, okay, so I'm going for a walk in the park, so it's 10 o'clock at night, don't know why I'm walking at that time, and then next minute somebody jumps out of the bush with a knife and holds <laughs> it to my neck. I am Does obviously plunges it into your neck, or no, holds just holds it, it to okay. my neck. You know, and they say, "Hey, get out of here! Give me your money!" And I say, "Which one do you want?" Anyway, forget about it. Forget about it. Okay, do you want my money or not? <laughs> uh, give me your money. Forget about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I will get frightened, and by the accent, by all of it, and. What's going to happen is my hypothalamus, which is the master regulator of the endocrine system, will release ACTH. Well, will trigger the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary, which the ACTH will travel via the bloodstream to the adrenal gland, stimulate the release of cortisol, and mobilize. But I will say, wait, this. wait, wait. Okay. Let me just finish this because you love interrupting before I even finish any sentence. Mobilize the glucose into into the bloodstream. Play around with heart rate play around with the immune system. It's basically trying to make sure the environment's as best as possible to deal with that situation and prepare it for the future. But the hypothalamus will also stimulate the sympathetic neurons or sympathetic outflow from the spinal cord that go directly to the adrenal gland, specifically the medulla, and stimulate it to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. And the thing about that is once adrenaline's in the bloodstream, it goes everywhere and yep. will bind to all adrenergic receptors and you have a system-wide fight-or-flight response. That's important to say because it, you can't really have a localized fight-or-flight <laughs> response. You can't just say, I'm scared and, I can, and only my pupils are dilated or I'm scared and only my airways are d- dilated. Or I'm scared it's only my heart rate that's gone up, right? It all happens. Okay. And that's because your system's flooded with adrenaline. All right. What, what did you want to say, Matt? Well, I was going to say this. Um, if this was the case, if let's say you weren't to also uh, bring in the sympathetic nervous system and you just did the cortisol release. Yes. By the time you responded to that uh, hormonal influx. Yep. Um, to the situation that, you know, you, you get in mugged. By the time it causes an effect, you'll be dead and a bloated corpse. Yes. Because really, cortisol a is... bloated corpse. <laughs> <laughs> so you chuck me in the river after, yeah, after it was right, done. Okay. That's right, yeah. Yep. So <laughs> my point here is... You've cor- thought this through. Cortisol. I feel like <laughs> you've thought about this. Cortisol is a steroid and it, it, the way it responds is, responds is via gene expression. All right? And so this is going to take probably a few days to really get to the point of response yeah to do all these things and so in a, in a way the cortisol is probably more um, a medium term stress opposed to a very high acute stress yes so we spoke at the very beginning of this podcast that both the nervous system and the endocrine system are communication networks mm. one's fast nervous system one's a bit slower and while both the sympathetic response and the re- result of cortisol are both there to communicate with the body for times of stress, it's the sympathetic nervous innovation that is allowing you f- to deal with the situation really in the moment. Yeah. And it's the cortisol, like we said earlier, that's helping you uh, basically prepare for the next one yes. or, or to prepare or for if your it's body an extend- to go or back. it's an extended one. Yes. That's right. So it's going over days. Yes. It's trying to maintain... Because when you have a fight or flight response in the moment your body gets kicked out of homeostasis. A yeah. whole bunch of things are happening yeah. that is not to the benefit of the, the I- individual long-term. It's yeah. to the benefit in that moment. So the cortisol is there to help sort of bring it back and maintain homeostasis throughout that time of stress. Correct. That's what, and, and so 
its sole purpose, I shouldn't say sole purpose because it's biology, but its major purpose is for me talking about cortisol is let's keep this body as best within the homeostatic range as possible during this time of stress. Mm. Now, if that lasts too long, then it becomes detrimental. Yeah. Because as we spoke about, it has immune modulating effects, bone yes. modulating effects, all these other effects that then would be harmful if you keep it going for longer periods. Exactly right. Exactly right. So now we've spoken about, did you want to talk any more about the adrenal gland? Obviously, it releases androgens. These are important. Uh, Which is still cortex, but we, we can bring these back in once we do the gonadotrophs. Yeah, so the androgens is basically referring to the fact that they, Andrew. they, they play a role in creating Andrew. Uh, <laughs> no, but in a way, uh, they play a role in uh, various s- sex-associated characteristics. So an example here would be um, many people think, say, in the female sex, mm-hmm. that it's purely just estrogen. Yes. And males is purely testosterone, but partly for, for these androgens in the, in the cortex, at least for the female side of things, there is testosterone being released. Absolutely. And that would result in some of the second sexual characteristics like hair, pubic hair, underarm hair, and they even suggest um, libido, yep. sex, sex libido. Yeah. And because these androgens are steroid hormones, uh, they play the, their effect is within the cell – transcribing DNA, turning genes on, turning genes off. Uh, Many can have what's called anabolic effects, growth-like effects. Uh, So people, so probably most commonly within the community, people think, oh, testosterone is an anabolic steroid. It makes your muscles grow big and strong. That's why bodybuilders take it to get big and strong. Okay, truth there. Estrogen is also an anabolic steroid, but it's anabolic in the sense that it helps the growth and development of the endometrium to prepare it, mm. to prepare the lining of the uterus for egg implantation. Yeah, and, breast, so, and breast tissue. And breast tissue. And, but estrogen is an, um, a, a, a stimulatory growth associated steroid, right? It's anabolic. It's mm. for growth. Mm. Catabolic means to break down, mm. right? Anabolic and means c- to... Cortisol would be a catabolic. Yeah. But let's talk about um, some of these hormones when we get to the gonadotropins. I think it's time to talk about the thyroid? Okay. All right. So importantly, we're still talking about the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And we spoke about the fact that it releases six hormones, growth hormone, which we've spoken about, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone, which we've spoken about. Did we talk about any others? Now we're up to... I think we still have to do prolactin. Yep. And... and- Thyroid and then the Okay, cool. So now let's talk about thyroid stimulating hormone. The hypothalamus will release a hormone thyrotrope, called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Yep. Travels down that blood supply, the apophyseal portal system, mm-hmm. down to the anterior pituitary, stimulates the release from the anterior pituitary of TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That travels via the bloodstream to the thyroid and stimulates the thyroid to ultimately produce thyroid hormones. Plural. Yes. So what are the two thyroid hormones, Matt? I'm not going to pronounce them. Okay, I will. But T3, T4. All right. T3 is triiodothyronine and T4 is thyroxine. That's easy. So importantly, people need to know that thyroid hormone is made from the amino acid tyrosine. But even though that's the case, it still needs to be, once it's made, it needs to be transported with a transporter protein. Thyroid's a real weird one because one it's an amino acid based hormone but it acts more like a steroid based hormone in regards to its intracellular and plays a role in transcription but also it needs a carrier molecule in the bloodstream most amino acids don't because they're polar yeah they can float in the in the plasma of the of the bloodstream and steroids can't because they're lipids so they need a carrier like albumin and that just while you're stating that yeah the cortisol and probably aldosterone is the exact opposite in the they're, sense? They're more steroid-like. Yeah. So they're um, hydrophobic. Right. However, they are hydrophilic enough to c- be transported in the blood without a carrier. There you go. But hydrophobic enough that they can cross the cell membrane to get into the nucleus. Isn't biology cool? 
but also tricky because it's not black and white. All right, so thyroid, uh, the thyroid is this butterfly-shaped gland, sits right at the front of the trachea, sort of hugs it. Not very big, not very uh, heavy, but pr- <laughs> pretty important, right? Like a shield. It is like a shield. Yeah, it looks like a shield, right? Is that etymologically what thyroid means? I don't know what thyroid means. Doesn't matter. So I said uh, it's made from the amino acid tyrosine but also is made from iodine, Mm. which is an important element from the periodic table, an important element that exists within... Salt. ...the environment. Well, so iodine is often in many plant matter. Well, it's in the soil. In soil. Right? And then the plants grow in the soil that contains iodine and then contains the iodine in the plants. The animals eat the plants and then the animals contain the iodine and we eat both the animals and the plants and we get iodine. However, there are some places and spots within the world where there's not much iodine in the soil and therefore not much iodine in the plants and the animal material, which means our body is deficient of iodine. Once iodine gets in the body, it becomes iodide and the iodide's in the bloodstream and the thyroid pulls that iodide out of the bloodstream and snaps it together with tyrosine to produce thyroid hormone or hormones. But here's a really cool and interesting point. If you look at the thyroid tissue, there's thyroid cells, which we call follicles. And these follicles, they take the tyrosine, they take the iodide, and they push it into this little pool, which sort of sits in the, um, and when I say pool, like a swimming pool, that the thyroid has called colloid. Colloid. So colloid is like a jelly-like, think of it as the water in the swimming pool, right? So this colloid helps to pull the tyrosine and iodide and bring it together to form thyroid hormone. But I want you to think about this. There are some places that don't have enough iodine Mm -hmm. and think about negative feedback. So you've got the tyrosine because that's an amino acid we can get very easily, no problem. But then the body goes, hey, I've got the tyrosine, I've got the colloid, I don't have the iodine, therefore I'm not making thyroid hormone, I'm deficient of thyroid hormone. This feeds back to the hypothalamus and goes, oh, better produce more thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which travels to the anterior pituitary, which goes, oh, better produce more thyroid-stimulating hormone, which goes back to the thyroid, and it tells it to make more colloid, pulling in more tyrosine, but still isn't pulling in any iodine, iodide because it's not available. So what ends up happening is over time, this negative feedback system bulks up all this colloid. You build up all this colloid fluid inside your thyroid and your thyroid gland swells up and you get this enormous protrusion in your neck called a... Goiter. Goiter, that's right. Now you don't really see goiters anymore. Why? Because we... Uh, what's the word doesn't matter we just put i i died yep. into the salt yeah so it's now iodized iodized salt yeah that's right so if you see iodized table salt it's there to help your thyroid yeah it's important you need that which is different to the the salt you use with the pink himalayan salt which <laughs> i, I still tell that. you not to buy it's but radioactive you just like it radioactive yeah. there are radioactive elements in that salt well <laughs> there are but there's probably radioactive elements in many bananas things. that's true um, we, well, talking about radiation, yeah, or radioactivity, oh, can yeah. you just quickly mention then if you were to be in locations where nuclear bombs went off or right. um, nuclear meltdowns, yeah, okay. why um, you may be instructed to take potassium iodide? Uh, because the iodine is one of the very first to be affected radioactively, right? Yep. yep. And if that's the case and you're using that iodine to make thyroid hormone, and then that thyroid hormone travels in your bloodstream to basically all the tissues. Thyroid hormone has receptors on every, in nearly every tissue of the body. And then you've got now radioactive thyroid hormone traveling through the system. Oh, so that's, that's the main reason? Well, the I, main reason is I it affects it just, the thyroid yeah, gland I it just itself. Knocked, I just thought it either knocked that off or you got cancer of your thyroid. Yes, which is what, is what happens. So what they tell you to do is take um, potassium iodide tablets. And that just gives over you supplies it. Fresh. And therefore the thyroid gland doesn't need any more iodide that's you've obtained radioactively yes. elsewhere. Exactly right. Uh, so that's 
so if you go to watch, I think Oppenheimer, which will be coming out soon, but I think also what was the TV show made about the Chernobyl? Chernobyl. They talk about that as well, uh, because it's just that was a good TV show. Wasn't there it was a good show. It's full on. Yeah, it is full on. But you know what? I know this is a bit of a digression, but we need more nuclear plants as alternatives for fossil fuel. Does it take a long time to make? Not really. Well, to build. My my readings suggest. You mean to build the entire ten years? Really? Yeah. Well, it's it's definitely a cleaner energy, but there's pros and cons obviously for it. I think one of the issues that people have is they conflate nuclear power plants with nuclear weapons. That's true. And they're not even close to being the same thing. Yep. It's just simply the term nuclear is referring to very small, yeah. right? Yeah. And so when you look at nuclear weapons, they take very simple atoms and elements from the periodic table like hydrogen and helium, and they either try to split them or fuse them. Generally, they can't fuse them. Um, because that's what the sun does and it needs a huge reactor to do that. So they try and split them. And when you split them, you release huge amounts of energy. Hence what the Oppenheimer movie is going to be mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. is trying to split the hydrogen atom. And theoretically, Einstein, who played a role here, he did the calculations about the... He's basically the one that wrote the paper that said, hey, you know what? If you were to split a hydrogen atom, this is the amount of energy that theoretically could be released. The thing is that the theoretical energy release from it is so enormous that they could not tell if they were going to release the full amount of energy from splitting the atom or only a part of the energy. Hence why during Oppenheimer, when they did the very first atom bomb explosion, they didn't... Where was it? In the deserts of Arizona or something? In the US. Yeah, I think Nevada. Um, New Mexico. They did not know how big the explosion would be because the... The, th- the physics said it could potentially be big enough to destroy the country or it would only be big enough to destroy that local... They didn't know how much was going to be released. Wow. That enormous explosion that came from doing that, um, I, and I could be wrong and I'd love someone to correct me, so I'm just working off the back of my mind. I think that was like 1% of the possible energy that could have been released. And isn't that the problem with it? Because we're, there's still so much energy associated well, you're conflating with it. That's the, that's the radiation that's still present within... Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, because uh, you get radioactive decay yeah. of particles over time. Now, this is not what happens when you use nuclear power for energy, right? It's a different process. And in actual fact, you know, and I know this is a huge digression, but if you compare it to fossil fuel, fuels, tens of thousands of people die every year, arguably hundreds of thousands of people die every year due to fossil fuels, whether it's directly because of work conditions and location, but also because of the pollutants that are oh, produced. Oh, yeah, just air pollution. I mean, right? millions of people die per year just from air pollution. Exactly, from fossil fuels. Nuclear energy is clean. Mm. Um, people who work in these nuclear power plants aren't exposed to excessive uh, amounts of radiation. Mm. Water can hold nuclear um, energy. I shouldn't say nuclear energy. Water is very good at containing radioactivity. So as soon as you put something radioactive in a big container of water, basically if you're sitting, you could be a few metres away from a a nuclear rod and you won't get any radioactive exposure. Because it's really good as soon as you take it out, sure. Um, So it's just about trying to maintain these big structures to get as much fuel. And the amount of fuel we pull out is not much. Like Mm. by the time we exhaust a fuel rod, still over 99% of its energy available in the rod. Hence why they have to bury it deep within concrete and it's going to sit there for millions of years and people might go oh this is a problem we've got radioactivity sitting we're going to hit a point where we'll be able to probably dig them up and safely use them again to get the rest of the energy from it huge digression everyone's probably turned off now (laughs) but i think it's important because people are scared they go what about meltdowns what about you know the uh the again chernobyl and what i guess i guess an interesting consideration now currently with the war in ukraine yeah is that can be possibly weaponized that a aggressor could uh, threaten to bomb a yeah. nuclear power point power plant and have the ramifications of fallout like a bomb. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, but I think 
you know, if you're living in a world where there is safety and assurances that there's not going to be another country that's going to blow yes. you up. That could um, be difficult in these day and age. Yeah, very true. Uh, but a, a few people die from this. Even yeah. with those meltdowns, very few people died in Chernobyl. Very few people died in Japan. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so anyway, huge digression. We'll probably get letters about all this. We don't need them. <laughs> all right, um, thyroid. It, so inside that follicle where it's producing the colloid and releasing the colloid, and then the colloid's pulling the tyrosine and the iodide, it makes T3 and T4. Now, ultimately, it makes T4 is what it makes, first of all. That's the first thing it makes. Mm. Now, T4 is thyroxine. That's what it releases into the bloodstream, and that's what travels to the tissues. It's, T4 is like a pro-hormone. Right. It doesn't really do it anything. It remade into T3, right? Yes, and it's at the tissue that T3 has all its functions. And we said earlier, basically every tissue of the body has a receptor for thyroid hormone. That's how important thyroid hormone is. So, you know, it has receptors at bone to influence bone growth and bone breakdown. Um, it's got uh, receptors at the cardiovascular system, at adipose tissue, um, you know, all over the place. Hence why thyroid dis- so when they, disorders so affect one of the, one of the widespread. classic functions that we're all told that thyroid hormone regulates is the basal metabolic rate. Yes. Can you just explain what that means? Yeah, so it's basically referring to the way that you... No, it, it's and is this in all cells or just the most uh, energy-hungry producing cells? Well, not producing cells, but just cells that are very energy-hungry. Okay, so what thyroid hormone does is it has receptors at adipose tissue and it can play an important role at, the, at this adipose tissue with um, mobilizing the tissue, so mobilizing the fat, releasing the, the, the stored nutrients into the bloodstream but also can play a role in the way that it's broken down and the way that it's stored as well so and it depends on the tissue so for example if you've got and this is just one example if you've got a lot of thyroid hormone it stimulates lipolysis Mm -hmm. which is the breakdown of fatty tissue at adipose tissue which means that people who have too much thyroid hormone probably be weight loss yeah have weight loss hypo it inhibits lipolysis so even if you need that fatty tissue for energy, it won't let you access it and it stimulates the storage of fat, even if you need that fat for energy. Hence, what it's doing is altering your available fuel sources and altering your metabolic capacity. That's why it says that. But it's not just the adipose. It also plays around with glucose as well, but also plays around with all the tissues of the body that need to grow and develop like bone and muscle as well, in addition to that adipose. So... It's actually extremely tricky to figure out the right amount, right quantity and the right effect that thyroid hormone can have on the body when it comes to metabolism. Hence why people who have issues with their thyroid and thyroid hormone, they can go from one day, you know, having problems with sweating, nervousness, palpitations to the next day, lethargy, um, uh, extremely subject to the cold, feel the cold, you know, so... It, it fluctuates, but broadly speaking, if we were to oversimplify, you could say that hyperthyroidism, too much thyroid hormone, results in an overactive metabolic system. Yeah. And hypo. In conjunction with a kind of a, a stress system as well. Yes. And hypo. And again, it's because thyroid stimulate, thyroid hormone has receptors everywhere to stimulate. And that hypo is an underactive metabolic system. Now, that's a gross over exaggeration, but that is broadly what it does so again if you have hypo increased lipolysis you have palpitations tachycardia weight loss nervousness if you have hypo decreased lipolysis tiredness cold intolerance decreased appetite so generally speaking you might might find weight loss in the hypo and weight gain in the hypo and it's also the distribution of the adipose tissue as well it will break down adipose tissue in certain regions of the body and spare others right Right, so you might find that the weight or the fat accumulates in some areas but disappears in others. Mm. So it's it's a really tricky, hard to sort of understand and balance hormone. But it's T three and T four. It's the T three that is the active hormone. Okay. Anything else you want to say about thyroid? No, we obviously need to do a whole episode on on it. Which I'm not sure we have. Have we done that? I don't think we have, but we need to. Okay. I think it's pretty important. So the thyroid. That's the thyroid. Um, what are we left with? Prolactin and the gonadotropins. Okay. So prolactin 
yes. as the name would suggest, yep. is promoting lactation. Right. And so this particular hormone, uh, what's the feedback loops again? Going back up to the... So you were saying earlier that it is a negative, it needs to be inhibited from the hypothalamus. Yeah. Right? And I think, was it dopamine? Dopamine was one generally of those? is considered. An inhibitor? Yeah, inhibiting factor. So without the inhibition, prolactin is just freely released? Yeah. All right. There are other things that will feed back to, to it to yep. increase the, the, the secretion, obviously. But without that inhibiting factor, which is, as you said, dopamine, it would be kind of left to be on its own to be amplified. And so where does prolactin act? Primarily, it would be considered... Um, at the breast tissue. Yep. And so um, what it m- m- mostly does is in the early phases of, let's say, pregnancy, so this would be um, before the baby's born, mm-hmm. it would be lactogenic. Right. Which would be the development of the lobules and the, maybe not the ducts, because I think that's more estrogen progesterone. Quack, quack. D U C T. Right. I think we made that um, earlier. Yeah. So that I think is considered the alveolic cells, which are the milk-producing cells. And not those in the lungs. Not those, but similar kind of arrangement, I guess, the way, the way they look. Yep. And then once the baby's born, it would be to maintain milk production. And right. I think that's galacto, because galic, yep. ga- what, what is it? Galactose? Galactose yep. is milk sugar. Yep. Galactopoetic, which is... Oh producing the milk production okay. whilst the baby is feeding. Not nice. not in the moment, but it's kind of a, a supply demand. Did you know relationship? So when a baby is suckling, um, this results in inhibition of dopamine. Mm-hmm. And so if that's if dopamine's been inhibited, then prolactin is free to be released. Yeah. Hence the prolactation. Estrogen, particularly in really high quantities which occur during pregnancy, stimulates prolactin yeah, to be released. That would make sense. So at the end of the day... And, I think, and I think vice versa, prolactin increases the sensitivity of estrogen and progesterone in, say, the uterus and the developing fetus as well. Yeah, exactly. So I think, generally speaking, you can say that dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin and that um, estrogen stimulates the release of prolactin at high levels. Yep. And that there's various things that can be done to either stimulate or inhibit dopamine. Yes, and, that's, and that right? actually goes to the effects, the clinical, if you have situations where you have hyperprolactemia. Yep. And so one of them would be pharmacological agents like dopamine antagonists. Yes, and that can happen with, uh, so for example, some kids who have, um, whether it may be ADHD or autism spectrum, uh, uh, they can have various uh, pharmacological interventions that are dopamine agonists, but it can result in the development of breast tissue because of this stimulation of the prolactin being released. Wow. So yeah. if, if it's an agonist, you would think it would be the opposite, but maybe it's just feedback with could the other be. hormones. Yeah, could be. So I just came across a, a resource that says in terms of the main causes of high prolactin release is a way to... Rem- remember this is the five p's yeah so you can have physiological as one of the p's and that would be breastfeeding right other things could be stress like high acute stress and i wonder if that because you've come across before where in starvation states Mm -hmm. where even men in small quantities lactate right and i wonder if that is from the same mechanism of high acute stress somehow physiologically inhibiting the dopamine yeah and then releasing prolactin and small amounts of lactation from males right then you have pregnancy which is obviously that's another p yeah the next p the next the next p is pharmacological which we just mentioned that's dopamine antagonists then you could have a a tumor so that would be a prolactoma and that would be a tumor in the anterior pituitary gland. Yep. And the last one would be polycystic ovarian syndrome, wow. which presumably produces high amounts of estrogen, which then has some kind of feedback loop on 
um, prolactin release. Okay. So that's prolactin. A few, um, a few other things which uh, a bit of a tangent, but just of interest. It seems at least in humans, prolactin is really just a hormone mostly centered around the, the milk production. But if you were to go into some other animals, it has other quite um, varied effects. So in birds, yeah. it helps with... Um, Plumage, so feather production. Really? And I think it also nests in behaviour. Okay. So what decide, what determines the particularly the female chicken to then sit on the eggs for a period of time? So that nest in That's response. Prolactin. Prolactin. Also... Even though they're not mammal... Uh, sorry, they're, they're not mammals. Yeah, be, it's interesting because... They because you would think that prolactin would be... Mammal specific. Yeah, right? I think, from my understanding, the closest crossover from a vertebrate into a mammal, because you you kind of have the crossover of what is it the um, what's the egg laying uh, monotremes. Monotremes. Yeah, but I think there are some birds that produce small amounts of epidermal secretions that are milk like. That are somewhat like that. That have. But they're not monotremes. They're not. They're birds. Right. That um, the the young chick feeds off. Yep. But it's purely immunogenic. Wow. So my understanding is the mammary gland is just a modified sweat gland. Yep. Right. Its first primary function is immunological. Okay. And its second function, which obviously mammals have been selected for, is nutritional. Huh. And so bec- because it's a epidermal driven kind of gland, yeah. it also has a role in uh, like sweat, yeah. uh, ion regulation. Right. And so in other animals like fish, it has osmotic regularity, re- regulation wow. effects. There you go. Which makes sense because if you wanted to produce milk, you have to shift a whole lot of ions around to make the fluid, right? Yeah. You need to bring calcium in, you need to bring fluids in and shift with types of carbohydrate and that's just moving fluids into different compartments. I didn't realise that. Yeah. See? So for the first time, you've brought up something that's... Useful. Well, I still don't think it's useful. Anyway, uh, is that all about prolactin? Anything else you want That's to talk about? That's the main things I came across. Okay, so we now need to talk gonadotropins. Mm-hmm. All right, so the gonadotropins, plural, gonad, referring to the gonads, these are basically the tissues that hold our sex cells. Uh, tropins tells you that these hormones go to these tissues to tell them to release more hormones. So the anterior... Or hormones slash cells makes more sex cells. Yep. So the gonadotropins, which are released by the anterior pituitary, is called follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They both play a role in the male and female sexual reproductive systems. But then We ne- have to do the female reproductive system. That's one of our next podcasts. Correcto. Um, the, these hormones are named after what they do in the female reproductive system. So... It actually gives you a really, once you understand what these terms mean, tells you really well what they do and where they act. Tells you nothing about what they do in the male reproductive system. So the males don't have follicles? Not, no. Not the same way? Not the same way. And we don't have uh, anything that luteinizes, which means to make yellow. So okay. let's first talk about the role that they play in the female reproductive system. And let's start with follicle-stimulating hormone because this tends to be the first hormone that's released can I do, during the reproductive cycle. Can I cycle. use an analogy here? Go for it. I hope it doesn't fall short. I hope it doesn't. But it kind of illustrates this point well with feedback loops. Yeah. No, but, but this is going to stuff up your analogy of the city a bit. Oh, look, everyone's forgotten about that anyway. Okay, all right. So let's say the, there is a father. Yeah. Okay. And he um, has t- <laughs> 10 daughters. Okay. One second, I've got a cough. All right, so he's got a father, 10 daughters. Yep. Right, and so he gives them more pocket money. 
Right. So they can survive on their own. Any okay. sons? No sons. All right. This is a female reproductive system. Okay. okay. So here you go. Here's, oh. here's your money. Um, you got to look after yourself, but, but I'll give you the money. You just have to be independent. All right. And so he's paying them every day. And so slowly after, over time, there is a difference between the 10 daughters. You know, some are more independent than the others. Some are really just um, reliant on just the money and don't do overly well. And one, some of them are much more proactive and doing better things with, sure. <laughs> with outcomes to the point where maybe one or two um, start to earn their own money. Okay. Okay. So in doing so, the father re- realises that they're making their own money and goes, you know what, you've become independent. I'm not going to give you any more money. Right. And stops paying them all. Okay. Okay. Now, as a result, pretty much only one is independent enough to survive. Right. Okay? And the rest what? Die of starvation. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is a terrible father. So nine die. Whoa. One survives. Okay. Bad dad. <laughs> one, one will continue to... To develop, develop and develop until she's ready to leave home. Okay. Okay. And the dad goes, wow, I'm pretty proud of this. So yeah. what, who cares about the nine I'm, others that have that's now right, that's right. died because what I'm of gonna do, What I'm going to do is I'm going to give this huge lump sum. Here you go. Now get out of here. And how long will that lump sum last? This 14 time? days. Oh, you mean how long he gives a lump sum or how long is a lump sum? Yeah, how long does that lump sum last? Well, it really depends on what happens next. Oh, okay. But he's basically saying, here's a, a wad of cash. Yep. Get out of my house. Okay. Now he's and, angry with her. <laughs> and off with you. <laughs> okay. And then the daughter leaves and that's, that's the end of it. Okay. okay. So, so that was pointless, wasn't it? So the analogy here... Oh, it is an analogy. All right. The father was the pituitary gland. Oh, you're not the dad. No. This I thought that this was... <laughs> Me. Sorry, I thought this was something oh, I've got two daughters, recently. but not ten. Well, you um, did have ten. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the father's the pituitary gland. All right. Okay. And the money he's paying yep. is uh, follicle-stimulating hormone. All right. Okay. The ten daughters are the ten developing eggs of that cycle. Okay. All right. Now... From a cycle, usually only one will dominate. Are there usually 10 eggs that do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. to start with. Okay. Even possibly more. Yeah. Okay, and then what happens is um, one of them becomes more dominant yeah. and starts producing estrogen. Right. And that estrogen feeds back to and the dad. And that's the money that they're making that's for right. themselves. Feeds the back energy. to dad. Yeah. Dad's like, oh, look, don't need to make any more FSH for this point in time. Yeah. I'm going to stop until about mid-cycle and then you get the LH surge. Yeah. With, with probably also some FSH, and then that's the point of ovulation. So then the daughter leaves or the egg leaves out of the ovary into the fallopian tube. All right. And then that point onwards really depends if the egg gets fertilised or not. Okay, look, not a bad analogy. Um, I'll do that, but then I'll quickly follow it with that. Well, so I'm happy with that. No, no, it, it was good. So, okay, let me then again try and reframe this in a way that makes sense to me <laughs> it's not upsetting and it's results in calling docs exactly, <laughs> exactly <laughs> right so we've got these two gonadotropins these two hormones released from the anterior pituitary follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone so follicle stimulating hormone when it's released into the bloodstream travels to the gonads of the female of females um, and stimulates the eggs that have been there since birth, mm. right? These primordial oocytes, as they're called, and basically says, okay, right now it's time to grow and develop. And like you said, a number of them will grow and develop, but only one will really push through Usually. into maturation. If you have more, then your likelihood of you know, twins and so forth. The rest will atrophy and yeah. be reabsorbed back Correct. and, u- and reutilized in other ways. Right, because they're broken down and we'll use the fatty acids and so forth Nutrients. to create other things. Yes. So that's what the follicle stimulating hormone does. Stimulates the follicle. So follicle is just, or follicular, is just another word for the cells associated with the egg, with the oocyte. Yeah, around right? the side of the, o- the oocyte, that's right. So these are the cells that help produce the estrogen. Yep. So as soon as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, you produce more and more and more estrogen. And as soon as it's at a point where the one of those eggs is big enough to have big enough follicles to produce enough estrogen, that negative feedback goes back to the brain and says, hey, or the pituitary, 
says don't worry about any more follicle stimulating hormone at this moment. Correct. Then that egg will ultimately, within a couple of days after that, be ovulated. So that means it needs to leave the ovary and be pushed out towards the fimbrae, the fingers of the... Um, Bloping tube. Yeah. Yes, the uterine tube. Uterine tube, sorry. Yeah. Um, but in order for ovulation to occur, we need the second hormone, luteinizing Usually, hormone. yeah, yeah. That's so, where the surge comes in, yeah. So luteinizing hormone will then be released at about day 14, which is usually the ovulation day. And what it does is it sort of helps to uh, weaken the wall mm. of the ovary. Yeah. And then that egg can be ovulated out of the... Uh, so remember that you've got those follicle cells that have been produced from the FSH that are surrounding the egg, surrounding the oocyte, just maintaining it and looking after it. And there's other cells like theca cells and so forth that are present there, which again, helping produce that estrogen. But at day 14, when the luteinizing hormone's produced, it basically says, away with you egg, pops it out. This is the daughter leaving home. And what's left are these remnants of cells. Eggshell. Like the eggshell. Yeah, it's like an eggshell that's left over. Which is yellow which then turns yellow, right? Which is called the luteum, the corpus luteum, the yellow body. And hence why the luteinizing hormone means to make yellow. Yeah. So it creates this yellow body. Now, as the egg gets taken in by the fingertips of the uterine tube and massages it into the uterine or fallopian tube, that egg will continue to move down the tube and hopefully meet up with some sperm, if that's what's intended at this time. And that remaining body, that corpus luteum, that yellow body, produces another hormone called progesterone. Progestation. And so what we've got is four hormones really playing a role in this female reproductive cycle where you've got follicle-stimulating hormone to begin with, which then produces estrogen, and then you've got luteinizing hormone, which then produces progesterone. So one of the things I tell students is think that FSH helps produce estrogen and estrogen prepares the lining of the uterus for implantation. LH produces progesterone, which further prepares the uterus for implantation. You know, it thickens... And the estrogen also, and both of them also go back to the breast to start to make the breast, um, you know, so ductal cells and so forth starting to grow to prepare for the possibility of a baby coming. Yeah, and remember, estrogen goes back to the anterior pituitary and stimulates prolactin further preparing milk production within the breast tissue. And so that's basically what, what these hormones do, FSH and LH, in the female reproductive system. It makes sense because they're named after what they do. But then when we start looking at it, the male reproductive system, which is a lot simpler. I like, uh, like us. Like you at least. And poorly named. Yes, <laughs> correct, like Matt. <laughs> Michael's a good name, I think. Uh, Let's talk about what they do. So the way I think about this is, remember I said FSH produces estrogen, LH produces progesterone, and together it prepares the uterus for the rest of the reproductive cycle. FSH and LH in the male does a similar thing. So basically FSH... Makes tadpoles. Well, well wait a second. FSH stimulates cells in the testes called Sertoli cells. And these Sertoli cells produce something called androgen binding protein. Yeah. ABP. Androgens are. Is there another name we can use instead of Sertoli? Uh, are they. Sustentacular. The Sustentacular. Yeah. So Sertoli is Sustentacular. They release androgen binding protein. So it's just sitting there now in the testes, not doing much. But LH, when that's released, it stimulates the Leydig cells which are called the interstitial yeah, I think so, cells, yeah. um, they release testosterone. So LH releases testosterone. Now, testosterone is an androgen. That's good because we just released androgen-binding protein from the FSH. So they bind together. And together, testosterone and ABP stimulate the process of spermatogenesis. It stimulates these stem cells in the testes and says, it's time to produce sperm. Not the right button. That'll, that'll do. That'll do. What about that one? <laughs> oh, that's the one that's, I should be pressing every time you make a joke. That's a sperm with a um, with a wheel wheels wheelchair. <laughs> that's that's right. That <laughs> yeah, that's needs, right. needs oil in. <laughs> so now we've got spermatogenesis, and it's pretty much that simple. So if you think about the testes and you think about the cells present, the sperm is made um, 
in the uh, epididymis. Or no, they mature, no, mature in the epididymis, um, but they're made in the cells within the testes themselves. Seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules. And if you think about the tubule as a hollow tube, because it's called a tubule, the cells on the outside are where the stem cells are, and they produce these, like you said, look like tadpoles. Well, not yet. They're kind of just globular. Well, that's and what I'm saying. As they move in towards the middle start of to the tube. They to grow a tube, tail. That's right. They mature. And then they get once they get into the hollow tube, they've got a tail. They can swim towards the epididymis. They can mature there. And then they can be pushed through the vas deferens or the, you know, and, and yep. for ejaculation. So for those students who are sitting exams, for female reproductive system, FSH leads to estrogen. LH leads to progesterone. For male reproductive system, FSH leads to androgen binding protein. LH leads to testosterone. Both of those systems together work to um, produce gametes, but also produce yes. the hormones that will have you know changes in sex characteristics. Absolutely. Mm. There you go. And that is the uh, gonadotropins. We missed one. Well, we did, we, that's that's all. That's all the hormones associated with the mare and the, the what? The mare and the what's the next level down from the mare? I don't over, even, oh, over. sorry. Are you talking about with the analogy we use? Not a female go, horse, no. Yeah, I was going, what are you talking about? Back to your animal analogies. Uh, yes, so the, uh, the mayor and its various administrative parties that sit underneath that run the government. And right? all, all of those are... Hypothalamus and pituitary. Pituitary gland, yeah. But there are other hormones that aren't necessarily directly regulated or produced from the hypothalamus and pituitary. Yeah. And and that's one of which is the parathyroid hormone. That's what I was going to mention. So behind... At the back of the thyroid, you have these four little P-shaped structures known as the parathyroid glands. Four to eight. The and number so, varies. And sometimes they're not where you think they should be. What do you mean? Well, they're not always neatly positioned behind the gland. They could be positioned elsewhere. Like in, in my ear. In that. Well, not so much there, but maybe in the superior mediastinum. Right. And, and part of the issue is if a surgeon wants to go in there to remove other tissue. Yeah. Um, the surgeon could accidentally remove parathyroids. Okay, so why do we need a parathyroid gland? I think predominantly it's to do with the regulation of calcium. Okay, so parathyroid releases a hormone which very simply is called parathyroid hormone. So that's nice. And it's... Para meaning around. Yes, around the thyroid yeah. gland or around the thyroid hormone. It gets stimulated to be released when your blood calcium levels are low. So it's released to try and maintain homeostasis. So to ultimately try and boost blood calcium levels up. So to do this, uh, it must act on a number of tissues because calcium's all over the place. So if you think about it, where is most of the calcium in your body stored? I think like 99% is in bone. Right. So that would be a great place for parathyroid hormone to act to try and release some calcium from the bone and go, look, you've got enough here. Give the blood some. And the way it does it is it doesn't act directly on the bone, but it has to stimulate certain cells called osteoclasts. Mm -hmm. Osteo meaning bone clast, referring to its crushing capacity. It sort of eats away. It's actually like a modified macrophage, right? Yeah. So and I, in, in your city analogy, this is the, the construction workers with jackhammers. Yeah, demolition and those big crew. swinging balls. That's right. On a crane, not <laughs> them personally. <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> so this osteoclast comes in and it starts to sort of eat away at the bone tissue and releases calcium into the bloodstream, thereby increasing blood calcium and rectifying the drop in blood calcium. But that's not all parathyroid hormone does, right? It can actually work synergistically with vitamin D, which is another hormone. So vitamin D is made from cholesterol that's in our skin. And when UV light hits that cholesterol, it stimulates it to change chemically. Now it undergoes goes a number of different changes where it changes in the skin and then changes in the liver, then changes in the kidney and ultimately produces the active form of vitamin D. Um, and that vitamin D can work with parathyroid hormone to help things like uh, increase the absorption of calcium from our intestinal tract, yep. 
can stop the kidneys from peeing out calcium calcium and holding on to it. It sort of just helps to, and also plays around with um, phosphate as well. So blood calcium levels are intrinsically linked to phosphate levels and vitamin D plays around. In actual fact, parathyroid and vitamin D can together alter both vitamin, uh, uh, calcium and phosphate, but individually they can't do both together. Yeah. Right? So they need to work together in order to play with both calcium and phosphate. But that's the function of the parathyroid. Now, interestingly, there was another hormone that the thyroid gland produced that we didn't talk about, which also plays with blood calcium called calcitonin. Okay, yeah. So the thyroid releases calcitonin, which basically does the opposite of parathyroid hormone. So if blood calcium levels are too high, it's going to say, hey, let's take some of this calcium out of the blood and put it into the bone, pee it out or poop it out. Yeah. Simple. Yep. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, when, when people do blood tests and they find that they may have elevated calcium or decreased calcium levels in the blood, outside of looking at, you know, do you get enough calcium intake or have you been taking too much calcium in, they could look at the parathyroid and thyroid hormones to see, hey, could it be an effect from these two glands? Right, right yeah. And, and as I said, I think at the start of the the podcast, you know, the, the way that these were discovered by, you know, the earlier science uh, projects were to remove them out of animals to see what the effect would be. And, you know, like we said, um, dogs and rats, and by doing so, by removing these glands, the result would be poor regulation of calcium yeah. and then bone deformities. Yep. What about... There's a hormone released from the heart, atrial natriuretic peptide. Now we're going into a into. Is that a hormone? It is, right? Yeah. But even though it's a peptide, it can it's a peptide hormone. But what, what were you saying? We're going into what territory where we could go on forever. I know, but I think we should bring this one up be, simply because it does the opposite of ADH. Well, aldosterone. Both really, yeah. Well, it's it's countering high blood pressure and high, pre- yeah, high pressure in the heart or in the atrium, right? And the natriuretic is referring sodium. to sodium. Yeah. So, since aldosterone deals with sodium to try and increase it in the blood to increase the water that follows and increase the blood volume and increase the blood pressure, the heart, if it's experiencing too much stretch because the blood volume or blood pressure is too high, it will release this atrial natriuretic peptide AMP and do the opposite. So, hey, look, just pee out more sodium. The water will follow, blood pressure will drop. Mm. Counteracting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. But you're right. We could go on forever because nearly every tissue is going to release a hormone that will do something. We haven't even spoken about the hormones released from the gastrointestinal tract. I think, I think the last one we should finish on is just the pancreas. Of course. Mm. Of course. This is a very important one. But so, even this one is considered... I mean, all these things we spoke about... Um, just now are glands. So you could make an argument that these are tissue or organs that are pretty much focused on just endocrine function. Right. Right? So the pituitary gland, for instance, yeah. is pretty much tissue or an organ, if you want to call it that, that's solely reliant or functions as releasing hormones into the blood. Okay. Whereas the hypothalamus... It has a whole lot of other functions outside endocrine. So yeah. it's probably a bit like the pancreas in the sense that it's a tissue that does endocrine stuff, but it also does a whole lot of other stuff as well. Yeah. And so, and, and, and the heart, another good example yeah. where it's a heart function isn't as an endocrine that's tissue. That's right. But it can do some of these things. So when we look at the pancreas, the pancreas by far is an exocrine. Yeah. So it's producing pancreatic enzymes to be secreted into the duodenum mm. as its primary job. But it does have these small cluster of cells and they were developed, well, I shouldn't say developed, they were discovered by Paul Langerhan. Okay. A German scientist. Is that why they're called Langerhan cells? Yeah. Right. And so these are just islets, little islands within the greater exocrine pancreas. Yeah. That discovered, oh, releases this thing that has an effect on blood sugar levels. So, And I think the first term used for this was yeah. islatin or I- islets? Islatin. 
not insulin. So where did insulin come from? I think it was derived from that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, the reason why I like talking about the exocrine and endocrine function of the pancreas is because they work together. So when you ingest a delicious burger and you're breaking down those macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs, by the time it hits the duodenum, the very first, so it goes through the esophagus into the stomach, from the stomach into the small intestines, that very first part, the duodenum, has a direct connection with the pancreas as a tube, a duct. And as soon as these macronutrients hit the cells within the duodenum, so the proteins, fats, and carbs, it stimulates the pancreas to release those enzymes, those pancreatic enzymes you were talking about. And these enzymes break down fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Now, ultimately, the enzymes that the pancreas releases that break these substances or, or macronutrients down will produce the smallest subunit of these nutrients that can get absorbed into the bloodstream. And now that they're absorbed into the bloodstream, they can then directly stimulate the pancreas again to release the hormones. So if your blood glucose levels are high, and even to a degree, amino acids and fatty acids, they can stimulate the pancreas to release insulin. Mm. And the job of insulin is to go, oh, I've got all these nutrients available in my bloodstream, but they're locked away in the bloodstream and they need to be taken into certain tissues so I'm the key to open the door to certain cells like the uh, adipose cells and muscle cells. And now these uh, nutrients can be brought into these tissues to be stored or utilized. And yes, that's the job yes. of insulin. When these nutrient levels increase in the bloodstream, particularly or most profoundly glucose, insulin's released to drop the blood glucose levels down and bring those nutrients into muscle and fat. Yeah. And we've spoken previously about the fact that insulin isn't required for many tissues of the body to bring the nutrients in, but it is for fat and muscle. Which is on bulk, the majority of volume, right? So if you mm. just look at the... Yeah, so even for me, it, I'm mostly muscle, and for you, mostly <laughs> adipose tissue. So if you look at the just cell number, they're not that high, but in terms of volume in the body, they're quite significant. And so if you're not getting glucose into these two tissue types, yeah. then you're keeping a lot of sugar in your blood. And there's, you know, the, the problems with this twofold. One, those tissues don't get energy, you get tired, you have many issues because you're not producing ATP, you don't function. But the other is we know that glucose isn't really nice to the blood supply, right? Gluc what I should say is glucose and blood vessels don't get along, particularly the smaller ones. And so if you've got elevated glucose... Oh, you mean over long periods of time? Over long periods okay. of time, the glucose can slightly change because of all the other substances that are present. And it changes in a way that's detrimental to blood vessels and damages often the smaller blood vessels, you know, those that feed the eyes, those that feed the extremities and so forth. And you can get diabetic neuropathies because it's damaging the blood vessels but also damaging the nervous tissue that's present. So glucose yeah. can be quite detrimental over time if elevated and remaining in the bloodstream and to the, the kidney and so to the kidney so the threefold glycosylation effects so that's kind of like the sugar at the top of a donut that's mm -hmm. what happens to these cells blood vessels nerves kidneys develop a nephropathy retinopathy and neuropathy yeah. which is quite devastating to these tissues yeah and the result is profound but yeah. even in the short term, if you just were to drink, you know... A litre of Coke. I could even say a litre well, of Coke, okay. right? Which has a lot of sugar. Sugar, it's a osmotic diuretic. So yeah. you'll be urinating for the next hour and a half. Yes. So if, yeah... Not non-stop, but, you know, but it, <laughs> a lot will be coming out. Yeah. Exactly. Which is called polyuria. Your body is very good at um, managing and balancing two things, sugar and salt, right? And you can really put a lot of both of those two things into your body for a long period of time before you have the detrimental effects. Obviously, some people are going to be more sensitive than others in a multitude of ways. When it comes to sugar, one of the biggest side effects early on is simply just weight gain, simply because of an increase of calories that you bring into your body. And for salt, it, you mainly just pee it out, right? But over time, these things accumulate and it's just about homeostasis managing and having a balance and so forth so yeah in the short term your blood glucose levels going through the roof isn't a problem it's about how well is it managed 
over time and throughout periods. So, for example, people have the constant blood glucose monitor on, which measures your constant blood glucose levels and and the insulin release and how it can change. If you're not a diabetic, it's telling you nothing because, of course, your blood glucose levels are going to change. You drink a you drink a Coke, you eat a meal, blood glucose levels go up, you release insulin, it goes down again. It, it, it's not about you trying to just maintain low levels of glucose or whatever it may be, right? Anyway, that's again, a bit of an aside. There's another hormone the pancreas releases that does the opposite of insulin called glucagon. And it's released when glucose is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, <laughs> right? I like that. So if your blood glucose levels are low, it's like, ooh, um, okay. This is telling us we don't have any available energy in, in, in the bloodstream to deliver to the tissues. Ah, uh, what can I do? I know I've stored some energy for later. And the kidneys and the liver and the muscle, they have stored glucose energies in the form of glycogen. And fat. Um, and fat, yes, and adipose, adipose tissue as well. And the, and the low blood glucose levels stimulate glyco- glucagon to be released into the bloodstream. And that mobilizes the stored glucose to be released back into the bloodstream, at least mostly by the liver, not as much by the kidneys and definitely Mm. not by the muscle because the muscle is selfish. It's stored glycogen stays there for itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's the, they're the hormones of the The, pancreas. Oh, the pancreas. I thought you were going to say the whole system. Any others you wanted to touch upon? Um, No, I think we've gone well over two hours. Do, yeah, I think we've gone three hours. Do you have any emails? No. Okay. No emails at the moment. Uh, feel free to send us an email if you want to ask us a question or if you want to say how awesome I am at what I do. Uh, you can send that to G U B I O S C I E N C E S at gmail.com. So that's G U Biosciences. Probably need to change that email um, at gmail.com. You go to our website, and I think maybe the website uh, contact us is now working. Yeah, well, I'm getting emails um, from the website. So Wonderful. Yes. So you can email us through the contact us on the website, or you can contact us on social media, or at least you can contact me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. I mean, everywhere else. Uh, Dr. Mark Tedorich. What about uh, the new one? Threads. I'm on threads now. How's so that going? I like it. It's basically a non-toxic Twitter. Is it? There's no ads yet, but they'll come soon. You don't have a search function, which is great, and you don't have a recommended either. So it's basically a it's showing the people you follow in a chronological order. And I don't think people know how to use it yet. People are trying to figure out what their voice is on that platform. But it's sort of nice because you're just sort of seeing what people are thinking and saying in a way with no sort of goal in mind per se um you know instagram people are very much selling themselves visually yep yeah on twitter people are selling all their trades right yeah um which is fine i think twitter has drastically changed in recent months right so i was listening to um uh, a professor at myu scott galloway and he was talking about musk elon musk and he said you know if elon didn't buy Twitter and use it the way he did, he would be seen by most people around the world as one of the greatest human beings of our generation. But as soon as we saw the type of person he is or on, what, Twitter. on Twitter and the types of things he's willing to say. But do you think there was already, or do you mean if he never used Twitter full yeah. stop ever, yeah. not bought it, but just ever, even if he didn't use it? Both. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I kind of got the feeling that he was starting to gravitate to that way inclined before he bought it what do you mean in what way controversial sure but if you have a look at him in interviews generally he's he seems to be relatively reasonable Mm. thoughtful and so forth but then you read the stuff he says on twitter it's intentionally provocative that's what i mean a little bit childish but he was doing that before he bought it that's what i'm my point on twitter yeah yes exactly and you know if he just didn't jump on that platform i think people would be like you know what this guy has Tesla, SpaceX, PayPal, all of these amazing things, and then jumps on Twitter, tries to jump into the space of the Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg, does it poorly. No one wants to advertise on there, gets rid of, you know, 6,000 of his 8,000 employees, 
Mostly for no apparent reason. And is mostly all those guys jump to threads? I don't think so. I actually think that... I think from what I heard that Musk is suing Meta... Just for copying. ...threads. Not just for copying, but also for taking their... IP. ...employees. But then threads... they're fired, how's that an issue? Well, threads... Well, because you sign um, clauses, uh, non-compete clauses. But I I think threads stated that they don't have any ex-employees of Twitter. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, it's interesting and I feel like I still like Twitter because I've got a, you know 60,000 followers on Twitter who appreciate the content I put out on Twitter. I've actually built a really nice community on Twitter, but there's a lot of toxic stuff on Twitter. Um, but if you want to join me there, please feel free. But I'm on <laughs> threads. Again, it's at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Please give us a five-star rating. This isn't me begging. This isn't me demanding. It's and also recommend topics. That's important. Recom- yes, yeah, send us emails. I think currently we're trying to work through all the systems as overviews. Yeah. So this will be a three-hour endocrine podcast. <laughs> but you know what? I think people... Okay, here's another thing. Send us an email and let us know, do you prefer... Like, do you mind if we do a three-hour episode that covers everything? Or would you rather us break it up into an hour, you know, multiple hour-long episodes? I, I mean, personally, yeah, I, I like the system-wide approach. I think with, say, the endocrine as an example, it's smart to do an overview. Yes. But then we could go in more depth in each individual gland yeah. or hormones. And we have and we will. Yeah. Uh, do we know what the next I think we should. going to do? Well, then we, have to, we can't really single out female reproductive system, but we should probably... Did we do male? We did male. Okay. So should we just do an overview of the reproductive system and then obviously probably spend a bit more time focusing on the female? Sure. I think it's a good idea. Or maybe we do them separate. Since we've already done male, we should do female. Okay. Um, yes. So like Matt said, send us suggestions. What do you want us to cover? What do you want us to do? Um, again, I know that a lot of people will listen to this because they're students and they're studying. So, you know, don't really send us an email saying hey, um, I'm a biochemistry student and I'm doing an assignment on a mutation in this very small niche gene. Can you do an episode on that? Remember, it needs to be broadly relevant to many people. Hence why we don't do super niche stuff. But diseases and disorders, yes, we still need to do certain neurodegenerative diseases. We need to do dementia, uh, so Alzheimer's. We need to do Parkinson's. There's a new drug released. Yes, we need, to, we need to do multiple sclerosis. So we need to do a, a range of neurodegenerative stuff. There's heaps, 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 heaps. I still want to do one on all the energy systems of the body. So phosphagen, glycolyte, anaerobic, aerobic, talk about all that. I've sort of touched upon them in various episodes, but I haven't focused heavily on them. We also have to do a lot of embryology ones. Mm, anyway, I think it's time to, um, time to go. Is that sperm again? Listen, everyone, uh, we do our short form A to Zs. Um, we release two every week, Monday and Wednesday. Uh, again, provide us feedback if you enjoy those. Obviously, there's a lot of fun in these long form episodes, but feedback. We love feedback. We do this for free. We Negative, take it out of our positive time. feedback. <laughs> just right. like the endocrine system. That's right. Thank you, everybody. You have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.